Number 10, Alchemex. Alchemex is the villainous corporation that exists in the alternate future of 2099, Earth 928. It is where Miguel O'Hara once worked and came up with the procedure that would ultimately grant him his powers. He was a brilliant geneticist that worked for Alchemax, but didn't like that he was being pressured to rush along his research and begin trials that he believed were unethical. When Miguel tried to leave Alchemax after a test subject died from the procedure, the CEO, Tyler Stone, attempted to prevent him from leaving by getting him addicted to a drug only Alchemax produced called Rapture, which is also apparently a highly addictive substance, so not so great for Miguel. Fortunately, Miguel would end up curing himself, getting spider-like powers, and end up escaping Alchemax, at least for the time being. Alchemax and Stone, however, weren't willing to let him escape so easily, and they would continue to pursue him. It's possible Alchemax could end up being the main big bad of it all in Across the Spider-Verse Part 1, and maybe Part 2, and however many other parts there will be. Number 9. Vulture. While I imagine we will get to see some of Miguel O'Hara's villains as we head to the future of 2099, I would also love it if we get to meet some of Spider-Man Noirs as well. In the reality of the Noirverse, Earth 90214, Vulture is actually a terrifying villain who Spider-Man Noir also has a pretty personal vendetta against. In that reality, Vulture is the one who is personally responsible for killing Peter's Uncle Ben. He was ordered by the Green Goblin of the Noirverse to do this, but still, he was ultimately the one responsible. Vulture here is a carnival geek. That is a person who travels around with a carnival and not having any particular skill sets of their own, usually performs by biting the heads off of live animals. Vulture went down this road and ended up with a very acquired taste for human flesh. As such, he devoured Peter's Uncle Ben. Later on, Spider-Man Noir would kill the Vulture for what he'd done, when he later attempted to kill his Aunt May. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about more amazing multiversal villains and just, you know, spider villains in general, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. And let us know if there's anyone in particular you want to learn more about. Number 8. The Lizard. The Lizard of Earth 65 is the version we are talking about here. On Earth 65, the same reality that Spider-Gwen hails from in the comics, Lizard is actually none other than Peter Parker. Peter Parker is best friends with Gwen Stacy, and after she becomes the spider-like superpowered hero in this reality, in his place, he wants nothing more than to be like her. He does not know, of course, that this hero, his hero, is actually his friend Gwen. Done with being bullied and having to have Gwen stick up for him as well, he creates a serum which he uses on himself. It gives him power, but it also turns him into the monster and villain known as Lizard. As his reptile Self takes over. The lizard ends up dying when he comes up against Spider Gwen and is only then revealed to be Peter Parker, Gwen's best friend. He dies in her arms. It's all pretty tragic. We saw an allusion to this part of Gwen and Peter's stories from Earth 65 in Gwen's origin flashback and in into the Spider Verse. But what if Peter didn't die? What if he's still alive and he somehow returns? That would be intense for Gwen to deal with. Perhaps he's an alternate of this alternate who is still alive, or perhaps, like I said, the lizard didn't really die in Gwen's universe. There are multiple approaches you could take here. I personally would love to see him come back because I just would love to see their dynamic. Number 7, Ultimatum. Ultimatum is actually an alternate and evil version of Miles Morales in the comics who hails from the main continuity of Earth 616. You see, in the comics, Miles is actually not from the main continuity, not originally, but instead from an alternate universe, the universe of Earth 1610, known as the Ultimate Universe, because that was the line of comics that it was a part of. The Ultimates themselves were actually a superhero team akin to Earth 616's Avengers. On Earth 616, Miles Morales was a criminal who ended up traveling for a time to Earth 1610. When he returned home to Earth 616, he learned that Miles Morales of 1610 was also residing there. Resentful of the other Miles Morales Spider-Man and wanting him out of his way, he aimed to send Miles and his family back to their home reality of Earth 1610 against their will, obviously. Fortunately, Miles and his uncle, Aaron Davis, aka Prowler, who also wound up resurrected and on Earth 616, foiled the plot of Ultimatum, defeating him. At least for now. Miles is such a sweetheart in the animated Spider-Verse reality, so I'd really love to see him fight against someone who is very much his opposite. I definitely want to see Miles take on his evil version. Number 6, Peter Parker 2099. In an alternate 2099 future, not the same reality that Miguel is from, Peter Parker actually becomes the CEO of Alchemax, the villainous corporation that Spider-Man 2099 once worked for. In this reality, Peter Parker was still Spider-Man, but allowed the public to believe that the hero was dead. Retired from heroics, he 
became the CEO of Alchemex, working sort of in secret because you know he's supposed to be dead. His plan was to fix his past mistakes and bring back all of those people whom he couldn't save during his time as Spider Man. This alternate version of Peter also has a prolonged lifespan due to fancy future anti aging technology, so that's how he's still alive, by the way. He attempts to get Miguel from the alternate 2099 reality, which is, I guess, really the main 2099 reality, and his own younger self to join him, but both refuse, prompting 2099 Peter to fight Miguel. This evil version of Spider Man, I think, could fit well into Across the Spider Verse as a main antagonist, considering his whole plot involves rewriting reality, which, you know, could potentially affect and threaten the entire multiverse. 2099 Peter Parker comes from the Spider Man video game Edge of Time, where he was revealed as the main antagonist. Or, well, he ended up kind of being the main antagonist, I guess, at the end of the game. Also, while Edge of Time wasn't well received, and I know that, the story in general was praised. And I think the story is pretty cool, so yeah, that's just my two cents. At number 5 is the Pyro Nightcrawler Chimera. Imagine a world where Pyro and Nightcrawler's DNA are blended together like a mutant smoothie. Now this flaming hot Chimera finds itself in the company of the Legion of the Night, a group of shadowy teleporting amalgamations created by Mr. Sinister. Their latest escapade involves a rather daring ambush at the Sanctum Sanctorium, but hold on, there's a little bit of a twist. After Vox Ignis uses her scream of change to instill some morals and values into some of the clones, the reformed members of the Legion found themselves in a clash of ideologies with their steadfastly sinister comrades, and the inevitable showdown followed. A brawl that pitted reformation against loyalty, and well, I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but let's just say things got heated. Pun intended. At number 4 is Sugar Man. No, he's not a candy enthusiast or a pastry chef. This guy's got a rather unique set of powers that'll make him stand out in the rogues gallery. First up, let's talk about his powerful tongue. Now I know what you're all thinking, how impressive can a tongue really be? You have no idea. Sugar Man's tongue is no ordinary one, it's like a versatile tool of destruction capable of piercing through almost anything. And I mean anything, we're talking stone, steel, and even beings in gaseous or liquid form. But that's not all folks, Sugar Man could do a bit of size and mass alteration as well. He's got this nifty ability to control his own mass, which means he can shrink down if he wants to, and when he loses mass, he doesn't just vanish into thin air, it apparently gets sent off to some mysterious extra dimensional space. Where exactly? Well, it's anyone's guess. Oh, and injuries are no biggie. He regenerates faster than you can say ouch. He's shrugged off blows that would even make Wolverine winced. Crushed by Colossus' boot? No problem. Beaten to a pulp with a metal pipe? back on his feet. Impaled with multiple pieces of metal? Just a minor inconvenience. But here's where things get really interesting. Sugar Man isn't just brawn, he's got brains too. Super genius intelligence in fact, particularly when it comes to all things genetics. At number 3 is Omega World Apocalypse. In the far alternate future of 3167 AD, civilizations crumble, races vanish, and the survivors, the Atlanteans and humans and the Stark Self, Wakandans, Mystics, and Moldoids find themselves under the oppressive rule of Apocalypse in a place called Omega World, a sprawling structure where Apocalypse has essentially become the heart, turning what remained of Earth into what's essentially an extension of his body. His horsemen, now acting as sort of antibodies or white blood cells, would cleanse the Omega World of anything which would cause him harm. Long story short, Apocalypse gets himself a fatal knife to the back by Nightcrawler, causing Omega World to crumble. At number 2 is the Sky Whale Brood Queen. Okay, this one is super weird. So somehow on Earth 13371, Charles Xavier becomes an Akanti Sky Whale. I. I, I can't even look at it. For those listening, imagine a giant cosmic whale with fleshy skin and a pupilless human face. It's truly a bizarre sight to be seen. But things get even more bizarre as our good old Xavier Sky Whale hybrid gets taken over by none other than the Brood Queen, set out on conquering the Marvel Universe and using Xavier as a vessel to transport her alien brood. Now, despite being telepathically controlled by the Brood Queen, Xavier's mental fortitude allowed him to keep most of his powers a secret from her. After teleporting to Earth 616, the Brood Queen was exterminated by the extreme X-Men. Once freed, Char Wales Xavier, I like that one, Char Wales, no, asks Dazzler to end his life as he knew that in this form he was weak and could be dangerous if controlled by a more powerful mind. Get dumped on, Brood Queen. And at number one, 
is President X. In this alternate universe, Charles Xavier, who never establishes Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, decides to become a politician instead. And yup, that's all it takes for Xavier to become the evil polar opposite counterpart to his 616 version, becoming completely wrathful, cruel, and a statistically megalomaniacal tyrant desiring nothing but total control over everyone around him. Cause remember y'all, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Though he's never revealed to be a mutant himself, it's speculated that Xavier's telekinetic abilities aided him in tracking down mutants across the nation. A stark contrast to his Earth 616 counterpart, this Xavier exhibited an authoritarian and cruel rule, causing protests notably from billionaire Anthony Stark. The catalyst for change derived as Stark formed the Avengers specifically to counter Xavier's regime. Unfortunately, Xavier's response proved devastating as a missile targeted the Avengers Quinjet, obliterating its occupants. This tragic loss included iconic figures like Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and other- Wait, Thor? Hold up, he took out Thor with a missile? Okay. With big players gone, Xavier's oppressive reign expanded further with all mutants confined to a grim prison in Texas, subjected to his psychological torment and horrifically abusive tendencies, even torturing some of them to their demise while subjugating the survivors to cruel experiments in an effort to control their mutations for their own good. This dark incarnation of Xavier remains a chilling portrait of power-driven malevolence, unafraid to exercise a ruthless authority. Number 10, Dr. D Doom. I love Dr. Doom. He just looks so cute. But of course, this is still a Dr. Doom alternate, so I imagine they're still quite menacing. Dr. Doom is just what he sounds like, an anthropomorphic duck who also happens to have a similar appearance and attitude to Dr. Doom of Earth 616. He makes an appearance as an adversary in the first issue of Peter Porker, The Spectacular Spider Ham. Being a cartoon version of Dr. Doom, aka Victor Von Doom, Dr. Doom also hails from the reality of Spider Ham's Earth 8311. We also learn in his first appearance that against his own will or his own interests, Dr. Doom happens to be a well-liked rock star, becoming famous against his wishes. He was trying to create his own rock group and make money off of them, but instead he ended up in the limelight despite his protests. Number 9. Killer Kravinoffs The Killer Kravinoffs are the grandchildren of Kraven the Hunter from the dystopian post-apocalyptic reality of Old Man Logan and Old Man Hawkeye, Earth 807128. With Kraven no longer around to hunt, in his place are his grandchildren. There are three of them, but only one ends up actually getting a name. Sadly, their existence in the comics is short-lived for how cool they look and should be as descendants of Kraven. They only appear in one issue of Old Man Hawkeye, showing up in issue number 4. They run into Marshall Bullseye there and actually end up getting killed by him. And friends, before we move on to the next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about even more alternate villains, there are so many alternate Spider-Man villains I could tell you about, so be sure to hit that like button. Number 8. Karn Karn ends up becoming the Great Weaver, an ally to the spider totems in the end. Spider totems are spider-like superpowered beings who actually receive their powers through fate rather than circumstance, as we were initially led to believe with heroes like Spider-Man. Karn was a member of the Inheritors, a coven of energy vampires who feed on various animal kingdom totems such as the spider variety. Spider totems. After Karn was blamed for the death of his mother, he was made to work to atone his misdeeds. He traveled around various multiverses, hunting down spider totems at the behest of the other inheritors. Though he never really enjoyed it, and thus was a reluctant villain. When the previous Master Weaver ended up dead, Karn decided to take his place and instead became an ally to the Spider Army, as opposed to a villain of theirs. He did, however, kill spider totems back when he was hunting and working for the inheritors, and a member of the inheritors, really. Like his fellow inheritors, Karn hails from the reality of Earth 001 and Loom World, which is their home world. Number 7, King Pig. King Pig is Spider Ham's version of King Pen. As such, King Pig hails from the same reality of Earth 8311. He is, as you guessed it, one big mean pig, who also happens to be a major crime lord, like his 616 counterpart. However, while King Pen in the comics is more into drug rings and other organized crime, King Pig is into smuggling cheese and running the cheese market. 
Mmm, now I want cheese. King Pig operated in secret, and despite the police trying to uncover who was behind the crimes in their town of Hockawatomi, Wisconsin, King Pig managed to be too sneaky for them to catch. In the end, it was up to Spider Ham to discover just who was behind all this illegal activity. We already had Kingpin show up as the villain in Into the Spider Verse, so how funny and great would it be to see his toon counterpart in Across the Spider Verse? Also, I'd really like to go to Spider Ham's like reality if we get a reality hop, which I think we're gonna get to do that. Number six, Goblin. In the noir verse of Earth 90214, Green Goblin's counterpart is simply known as Goblin. Here, Norman Osborn is still a ruthless villain who is the major crime boss in New York and leads his own villainous group known as the Enforcers. The Enforcers are made up of former carnival freaks who each have their own unique talents, featuring characters like the noir versus Vulture and Chameleon. Goblin turned to a life of crime because he was mistreated. Himself Himself being a circus freak who was ridiculed for his scaly, green, reptile like skin. Goblin in the comics is the one who is ultimately responsible for the death of Peter Parker's Uncle Ben and for the death of Ben Urich, the reporter and Felicia Hardy's former lover in this reality. Number 5, Carnage 1602. This version of Carnage hails from the reality of Earth 311. What is Earth 311? Well, it is considered to be the comic book home of the 1602 reality. If you aren't familiar with 1602, let me get you up to speed. In this reality, many of the classic heroes and villains we know and love from the present day in the Marvel comic book continuity were sent back in time to come to prominence instead during the year 1602. This was done as part of Kilgrave the Purple Man's plot to remove Captain America in another timeline where Kilgrave basically became president of the United States. He was like, look, I don't want to deal with Captain America. So rather than killing him and making him a martyr, Kilgrave decided to displace him in time. So instead, heroes like Captain America, Doctor Strange, Nick Fury, Spider-Man, and Black Widow existed way before they would normally back in the past. The version of Carnage that exists there was Canis Cassidy, who claimed to be possessed by a demon. He wouldn't appear in the standard 1602 series, but instead was introduced in an alternate reality story featured in Amazing Spider-Man issue number one from 2015. Number four, Aunt May. Yep, there is an alternate version of both Aunt May and Carnage combined together out there. This version of Aunt May is sadly a lot more evil than her usual self. Or maybe not so sadly if you are into an idea of a, an evil Aunt May. She appears in the 2019 Spider-Verse comic where she faces off against Spider-Man and Miles Morales. Spider-Man, who is the spider-themed hero of Reality 3123, is forced to channel the power of all her heroic alternates across the multiverse in in order to defeat this version of Carnage. So while she might be Aunt May, that doesn't mean she is any less ruthless or horrifying than say, the Cletus Cassidy of Earth 616. Number three, Spider-Man slash Batman. One of the craziest appearances of Carnage has to come from the crossover comic, Spider-Man slash Batman. If you're wondering how these two heroes from two completely different publishers managed to get together in a comic book, the answer pretty much is Amalgam. This is around that time and DC and Marvel were doing a bunch of cool crossover things. Back in the day, Marvel and their distinguished competition were actually a lot more willing to team up if it meant telling cool stories by teaming up cool characters who you'd otherwise never see meet each other. I'm sure the money they made from these crossovers also didn't hurt either. In the Spider-Man slash Batman team up, Cletus ends up seemingly being cured, but has the chip that essentially cured him disabled by his symbiote, returning him back to Carnage. Once free, Carnage kidnaps Joker and basically does the same for him because he was also, you know, cured, proposing that the two of them should team up. Doesn't work out too great, but it's a pretty wild team up idea. Number two, Carnage Cosmic. There was a time when Carnage actually ended up going cosmic in terms of his power source and level. The Carnage symbiote at one point jumped ship to Norrin Rad, one of the Heralds of Galactus. While in the main continuity, the bond between them did not last, there is a what if comic that imagines what could have happened had the bond between them remained. In the end, in this alternate reality, in order to prevent Carnage from having too much power and control over him, because the Silver Surfer was like struggling, he ended up regaining control temporarily and use that time to hurl himself along with Carnage 
into the sun, sacrificing himself. However, apparently that wasn't actually the end, as somehow the two of them survive, reappearing again in the 2013 comic Longshot Saves the Marvel Universe issue number three, which I didn't even know was a thing, but apparently it is, and now I'm curious and I kind of want to read it. This happened probably thanks to Silver Surfer's powers and not Carnage, who, you know, is pretty susceptible to fire damage. But maybe the power of Cosmic somehow saved them. Number one, Grendel Symbiote. While this is still technically Cletus Cassidy as Carnage, some may consider the Grendel Symbiote to be a different version of Carnage altogether, since the Carnage Symbiote itself at this point in the story is kind of dead and gone. And honestly, so is Cletus. He basically is a corpse that was revived and like, put inside a symbiote so he could be brought back to life. And I guess maybe if there's a little bit of blood left in him, Carnage could come back through that. I don't know. He still has consciousness and everything, but I'm not sure if we'd quite call him alive here, and I'm not sure if we'd quite call this, you know, original Carnage. Definitely it's a different version. This version of Carnage is probably one of the most horrifying when you consider its purpose. The Grendel symbiote takes the place of Carnage and is used by Cletus to hunt down all the codices on Earth, which exist inside former hosts of symbiote spines. Acquiring the codices bolsters his own power, with the main goal being to wake up Null, god of the symbiotes, one of the biggest bads around, which is supposed to happen once all the codices have been gathered and combined. Number 10, Essex. This version of Mr. Sinister hails from the Age of Apocalypse of Earth 295. AOA, or Age of Apocalypse, was a continuity and reality that was born out of Legion, the son of Charles Xavier, traveling back in time and attempting to eliminate Charles' rival, Magneto. However, Legion instead missed his target, and Charles ended up being the one eliminated instead of Magneto. As a result, Legion eliminated his father and ended up accidentally erasing himself. Here, Essex is an ally to Apocalypse, a somewhat reluctant one though, as he also also attempted to take power for himself when he merged together the genes of Jean Grey and Scott Summers in an attempt to create a supremely powerful mutant being, which he hoped to have under his control. Unfortunately for Essex, in attempting to hide this young mutant named Nathaniel Grey from Apocalypse, he lost track of him, and instead, Nate escaped and was found and raised by the Mutant Forge. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know you love us by clicking that like button. Seriously, it's good for you it's good for me. Number 9, Nathaniel Essex. Technically the original Mr. Sinister. This version of Sinister is the OG. Nathaniel Essex is the man Mr. Sinister was before he became the cape-loving, mutant gene-obsessed man, mad science geneticist that we have today. How did he get there? Well, initially Nathaniel Essex was just a scientist obsessed with Darwin's theory of evolution. He believed that it was possible for people to dramatically evolve based on certain factors which he found and, of course, named after himself. The loss of his young son only made him throw himself more into his work, but the academic community did not see or appreciate the value of Essex's findings, believing him to be mad and also quite immoral. And honestly, I can see where they, why they felt that way based on his research. They kicked him out of academia as a result of him not letting up on his beliefs surrounding evolution. He would later run into Apocalypse and decide to become a reluctant ally to the mutant whose very existence proved his theories were true. Number 8, Apocalypse. One of the weirdest but still super brutal versions of Mr. Sinister comes to us from the ultimate continuity and reality of Earth 1610. Sinister has always had his story closely entwined with that of Apocalypse. However, in this comic, he isn't just connected to Apocalypse, he actually becomes Apocalypse. This happens over the course of a few issues after Sinister becomes an enemy to the X-Men, seemingly claiming to be working for Apocalypse, who of course hasn't been seen for years. While some think Sinister is delusional, it's later revealed that he was actually telling the truth, and he eventually transforms straight up into Apocalypse at one point. Number 7, Mother Righteous. Mother Righteous is one of the four sinister clones that replaced Essex after his death. She is known as the clone of hearts, thanks to the heart-shaped symbol on her forehead. Unlike the other sinister clones, Mother Righteous is under no illusion that she happens to be the original Mr. Sinister. Instead, she rightfully believes and acknowledges that she is one of four clones that he created before he died. She is the only one of these clones who is a female and 
she happens to have a very thick accent that is akin but not exactly belonging to East London, but sounds similar to that. Rather than stay based in the realm of science in terms of her purpose to figure out how to solve the evolutionary problem of AI and machines becoming the dominant ruling group in the cosmos, she decided to look into other more mystical means of knowledge, which I think of as another layer to her character that makes her even more unique among all the alternate sinisters that we've had. Normally you'd never expect a sinister to be a magic user, and she messes with those expectations that we have for sinister alternates really beautifully. Number 6, Nathaniel Essex. While Mr. Sinister becomes Apocalypse in the Earth 1610 reality, this isn't the only version of Nathaniel Essex that exists in this continuity. In fact, there is another that appears three issues earlier in Ultimate X-Men issue number 46. Initially known as Nathaniel Essex, this version of the character originally worked for Norman Osborn and was working on creating a super soldier as a bioengineer. Not being allowed to run human trials during his time at Oscorp, he ended up using himself as a test subject. Now, he did succeed in acquiring superpowers, but seemingly at the cost of his sanity, believing that a being known as Lord Apocalypse was attempting to reach out and communicate with him, which as I said before, a lot of people thought he was pretty crazy for that. He does, of course, also end up being reborn as Apocalypse eventually, which I already talked about in my previous point, but we already know about that version. After Apocalypse is defeated by Phoenix, Nathaniel Essex's human body is revealed to still be within Apocalypse's form, meaning that technically we kind of have like two versions of Nathaniel, the one that becomes Apocalypse and the one that still remains inside himself and just emerges after. Following the events of Ultimatum, he ends up as a somewhat reformed scientist working for Roxxon Corporation. Number 5. What if Doctor Doom had become a hero? In this reality, Victor had a life that was quite similar to his Earth 616 main continuity counterpart, up until the time that he was in university, and Reed Richards gave him advice on his experiments. In this reality though, Doom decided to actually take Reed's advice and implement it, avoiding becoming injured and scarred. Victor would then seek Reed's help in reaching out to the afterlife to contact his mother Cynthia. Now the two actually succeeded in doing this, and Doom learned that his mother's soul was being tormented in a version of hell. Instead of having a suit of silver metal armor, this version of Doom would acquire a golden suit of armor that was made for him by Tibetan monks. He left his studies in university and set out to study the occult and gain further knowledge of the arcane. He acquired the knowledge needed to save his mother's soul and in doing so became a sworn enemy of Mephisto, in whose hellish realm Cynthia's soul had been trapped. And of course, I mean, even in the main reality, I feel like Doom and Mephisto never really get along, do they? Number 4, Dr. Doom. Uh, Dr. Doom. I love Dr. Doom. Just the whole look of this character is fantastic if you ask me. Dr. Doom hails from the reality of Earth 8311, which is the tune reality that Peter Porker, aka Spider-Ham, is from. What I think I love most about him is that he is Doom, but is also a duck. I don't know why, but I feel like a character like Donald Duck would, or maybe Scrooge McDuck would, make for a good fit when it comes to what his duck persona could or would be like. Dang, now I want more Marvel and Disney classic crossover content. That would be super cool. This version of Dr. Doom is not only a major villain from his universe, but also at one time successfully became a pop music sensation and star. Fun fact. Number 3, Sorcerer Supreme. For those who are unaware, Dr. Victor Von Doom has always been in the running to become Sorcerer Supreme. He's considered to be one of the prominent magic users in the running for this position, should we ever need someone to replace Dr. Strange. Kind of both a terrifying and exciting prospect. In the reality of Earth 938, as seen in 1989's What If series in issue number 52, we answer the question, what if Doom became Sorcerer Supreme? He becomes a student of the Ancient One here, hoping to find a way to save his mother, Cynthia's soul, after failing to do so on his own. This version of Doom also runs into the alternate reality of Stephen Strange, who still seeks out the Ancient One for help to heal his hands. Doom's response is to basically simply chop them off and replace them completely with robot hands that are even better than Strange's ones once were originally, and causing Stephen to simply become a footnote in this alternate Doom story. I love I love that fix that Doom has. He's just like, why don't we just chop them off, replace them with some robot hands, fixed. Number 2, 1602. I just love the whole design of Count Otto Von Doom. He looks amazing. I mean, a lot of things in 1602 are well designed, to be honest. This version of Dr. Doom is from the reality of Earth 311, also known as the 1602 reality. Here, the heroes and villains of the Marvel Universe existed much earlier than their comic book counterparts, coming to prominence in the year 1602. In this world, Doom is still the ruler of Latveria and is obsessed 
with power. Also a villain in this universe, Doom seeks power at any cost and is willing to go to great lengths to remove anyone in his way on the path to getting it. Number 1. God Emperor Doom God Emperor Doom is one of my favorite versions of this character. Technically, technically, he is still part of the main continuity, but also Technically, that is also an alternate reality that Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four cleaned up. So although it exists as part of the main continuity in a linear sense, it doesn't really exist for Doom anymore. I don't think he'd even remember that any of this happened. God Emperor Doom is a version of Doom who basically ended up ruling all of reality during the 2015 Secret Wars event. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Well, because the incursions were destroying the multiverse, things, universes, Earths colliding with each other, and fortunately, Dr. Doom was able to save everyone by taking the power of the Beyonders, and more specifically, of Molecule Man, which is how we later find during the event that he's had all this power, for himself. He used this newfound power to create a, the patch-like battle world, where basically each realm represented a different universe, for the most part. However, this world left much to be desired, and everyone also seemed to be kind of beginning to realize, waking up to the fact that Doom was controlling and manipulating them with, um, his power, and keeping the truth of what had happened from them. They rebelled, and in the end, Reed Richards ended up being given Molecule Man's powers. He and the Fantastic Four would then use them to rebuild the multiverse, which is why this world no longer exists, but still happened. It's a thing. Alright, coming in at number 10 today is The Reigning. The Reigning storyline happened in Thor Volume 2 from 2003 to 2004, and it basically saw a future where Odin passed at the hands of Surtur, and Thor took his place, but then took Asgard to Earth and essentially put the entire world under his rule for hundreds of years. It created a dystopia where Asgardians were the elite and humans just tried to survive. Loki in all of this played the role of chief advisor and prime minister of the magistrate residing over new Asgard, and he seemed to have become Sorcerer Supreme along the way. Or at least he had Doctor Strange's stuff. But with Thor becoming a shell of who he once was, Loki had been secretly providing, as well as profiting off of, internal strife in order to consolidate power for himself. Classic Loki. He was responsible for slaying Baldur, the Avengers, Scarlet Witch, and Jane Foster. He did a whole heck of a lot more, but he absolutely paid for it before this reality was erased by Thor himself. They denied Crocodile Loki. In this timeline, Loki was either born or turned into an alligator, but you know, of course I'm gonna talk about Crocodile Loki. Not alligator Loki, That's there's a difference. One day, he reportedly ate a neighbor's cat and then was detained by the Time Variance Authority for creating a Nexus event, which caused a detour in their version of the sacred timeline, because he wasn't supposed to eat the cat. Oh wait, no, he was supposed to eat another neighbor's cat. Y yeah, apparently that's going to ruin the universe. Uh, you ate the wrong cat. I don't know how that that's possible when it's a sacred timeline, but you know what, that's aside the point. They needed to get the merchandising in there. He was then subsequently pruned and sent to the Void where he met Kid Loki, Classic Loki, Boastful Loki, and yeah, you know, it, it, it's the classic Loki tale, but as a crocodile. Ah. Uh. Joys. As they made their way across the void, uh, Loki demanded an explanation for his current whereabouts, forcing Kid Loki to silence him, <laughs> um, which is just funny, because this freaking alligator could talk, but oh well. Uh, yeah, it, it's Loki, but as an alligator, okay? That's why he's on the list. There's not much more than that. It's just funny. Number 8. Raised by Frost Giants A perfect what if tale. It's almost surprising it wasn't done before this point. In What If Thor in 2018, we get the story of what if Thor was raised by Frost Giants instead of Loki being raised by Asgardians. Simple, but brilliant. Laufey, the king of the Frost Giants, defeats Odin in their battle super long ago, and just as Odin took the infant Loki, Laufey takes the kid Thor and raises him as his own. Loki is obviously here too and like usual, Thor and Loki form a pretty tight bond as adoptive brothers. Unfortunately though, due to Thor's strength and skill in battle, not to mention his fondness for summoning the power of lightning, he is praised among the Frost Giants and by Laufey himself, who begins to completely forget Loki, his actual true son. Instead, Loki finds the captured Freya in the dungeons and she teaches him how to use magic. Loki eventually busts her out of prison and together they attempt to escape to Midgard. They go to the ruins of Asgard first and attempt to repair the Rainbow Bridge until Thor and Laufey show up. Loki ends the life of his father while Thor unknowingly ends his mother with a blast from his giant ice hammer ice crusher. Thor almost takes out his brother as well, but at the last minute, he lets him go. We don't know what happens next, only that Loki went to Midgard, had kids and a family, and apparently became a hero. So, 
Yeah. And it's 7 Earth X. The entity that would evolve into Loki originated on a distant planet under the manipulation of the Celestials. Through their reproductive methods, the Celestials infused an embryo within Loki's world, altering the genetics of its inhabitants to grant them protective abilities for said embryo. Over time though, Loki and its people underwent various mutations that led them to lose their distinct forms, becoming defined by external perceptions. So it's kind of like an eye is in the beauty of the beholder thing, um, except it's with people. Having fled their planet, they arrived on Earth and encountered the ancient Norse civilization, particularly a storyteller named Donnerson. And he played a crucial role in shaping Loki and the other Asgardians, believing them to be gods of their legends, you know, just on Earth this time. Eventually, Donnerson merged with two Asgardians and assumed the role of Odin, but, but yeah, Loki lost all awareness of his true origins. But like, yeah, yeah, it's it's weird. It's it it's definitely a weird one. Number six, boastful Loki. Not much is known about the history of this Loki for certain, and that's what makes him so intriguing to me. He claimed to have defeated his world's Captain America and Iron Man, and collected all six Infinity Stones. But his tales of exploits were not taken seriously, even by other versions of himself. He also wields a very strange-looking hammer that seems to be made out of a chunk of metal eye beam with a piston rod for a handle. I think that may be the part that has me the most curious of everything about him, to be completely honest. In any case though, he was arrested by the Time Variance Authority and pruned, ending up in the void at the end of time, and he has teamed up with classic kid and alligator Loki, like we talked about before, before he betrayed them, making a deal with President Loki. Spoilers, sorry. <laughs> Halfway through into number five, Sorcerer Supreme. Yeah, you thought that Alligator Loki was scary? What about Sorcerer Supreme Loki? That's true terror. Following his dethronement in the 2017 arc Loki Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange was stripped of his title, his abilities, and his aide Zelma, leading to him becoming a, a veterinarian. <laughs> For elderly talking dogs, specifically bats. His talking dog. After a failed encounter with Loki, uh, resulted in Bats' death, Strange ends up pulling a John Wick and uh, seeks aid from a greater force to, to counter the god of mischief. That's what those movies are about, right? While Loki ranks among Marvel's most supreme magic users, his power alone can't really match Doctor Strange. But man, um, yeah, with with the Sorcerer Supreme powers, he's, he's just he's yeah he's gonna go kind of nuts. And then and then like I said, there's John Wick vengeance and then obviously it doesn't last forever but like yeah uh, Loki with Doctor Strange powers that's going on the list no way that's not going on the list number four Avenger Prime Avengers Forever is a true treat for anyone who loves the multiverse and seeing alternate versions of different Avengers it's truly a lot of fun Robbie Reyes the all writer or he was a ghost writer but he became all writer is pulling together this awesome Avengers team that faces up against the doom above all an army of Mephistos and doom's masters of evil the team is super cool, but during a critical battle against multiple versions of Doctor Doom and Mephisto, the multiversal Avengers seem to have no magic users, which is super weird, but then the Avenger Prime comes waltzing out of a portal stating that he is the Prime Avenger because you can't have the Avengers without a Loki to bring them together. And it's Loki as Avenger Prime, and it's super cool. This Loki became King of Asgard and a hero, and then he discovered the other Lokis in the universe were bad guys who always fought the Avengers. So, he made sure his his Avengers never existed and fought all of Earth's threats himself, which led to the end of life in his universe, including his own. But then he woke up in the God Quarry where he came into contact with alternate versions of Avengers, creating the multiversal Avengers and an Avengers Tower inside the God Quarry to run the whole thing. That's all I have to say about that. In at three, DB Cooper. DB Cooper is an alias associated with an unidentified man who commandeered Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, a Boeing 727 airplane. In November of 1971, Loki lost a bet to Thor, and as a result, he had to visit Earth in order to pull off a heist. He hijacked the Northwest Orient Airlines flight 305 in the United States under the pseudonym of D.B. Cooper, informed Florence Schaffner that he had a bomb and demanded $200,000 in ransom. To comply with the hijacker's demands, the plane landed, exchanged passengers on the plane for the ransom money and backup parachutes, and then they went back up in the air. Loki then collected the ransom money and uh, proceeded to to jump out of the airplane with a parachute, only to be transported back to Asgard by Heimdall using the Bifrost Bridge, leaving only a few $20 bills in his wake, which is where the mystery comes from, because if you don't know, D.B. Cooper jumped out of the plane, never to be seen again, but 
they couldn't find a, a body or the briefcase, but they found bills in the water somehow. So yeah, uh, if you were wondering, it was Loki, at least in the MCU, although probably here too. We just haven't figured out that they're real yet. Number two, ultimate Loki. Loki Laufey's son in the main Marvel Universe is a pretty dastardly devil. He's always got schemes on schemes and is just doing what gods of mischief do best using his sorcery, but he's also somewhat redeemable. The Loki Odin son of Marvel's ultimate universe is kind of just a madman, but one with the ability to warp reality. He could retcon history into anything he desired by either creating events that never happened or erasing events as if they never happened. He could create copies of himself, change the color of the skies, render himself near impervious to harm even from Thor's hammer and summon armies of monsters. One of the first things this Loki does while a member of the Warriors 3 alongside Thor and their brother Baldur is visit his giantess mother, steal the Norn stones and completely take the life of Baldur. He then took on the guise of Baron Zemo during World War II and led an attack on Asgard with frost giants, Germans and some super soldier Germans that he created. This got him banished to the room without doors just like he planned apparently. He was then eventually free freed from the room and unlike his brothers who had been reborn as mortal men, Loki was still a god and an incredibly powerful one. He would be one of the main threats faced by the ultimates when they formed but was eventually depowered by Odin. So sucks to suck. Actually I'm pretty sure he came back so I guess it sucks for us. And finally in a number one necro god Loki. If, if you don't understand why that's number one just from the name alone then yeah I guess I'll explain it. Originating from all black and the infamous necroverse, this incarnation of Loki stands as the most formidable and the most badass. Following the closure of Following the closure of Agent of Asgard, Kid Loki and King Loki's narratives, Loki becomes consumed by vengeance against all of life. Yeah, when you're tired of fighting against your brother, why not fight life? In a catastrophic turn though, he orchestrates a cosmic scale level devastation of just everything, binding with all black the Necro Sword by deceiving Ego, the Necro World. He turns Ego into the sword's other end, acquiring immense power, and uh, yeah, notably Necro God Loki clashes with old King Thor, resulting in the extinguishing of the sun, and he ruthlessly wipes out Earth's entire population. Yeah. What the hell? He can also time travel, because why not throw that in there? They're already gonna wipe out Earth. There's no stakes anymore. But yeah, yeah, just. Yeah. Number 10. What if Gwen Stacy had lived? I kind of love this one for Norman Osborn. I mean, he's a complex dude, and while sure, he's usually one of the worst folks out there, I do believe that there is at least some good in Norman. In fact, most of the reason that he tends to even become evil is because of his goblin persona. In What If, issue number 24 from the original series, we answer one of the most often contemplated questions in Marvel Comics history. What if Gwen Stacy had lived? For Peter, this means proposing and getting engaged to the girl of his dreams while also having his secret identity exposed, leaving him trapped in his own city. For Norman though, this leads to a reconciliation with his son Harry that seems to send him towards a permanent path of recovery when it comes to his mental state. So he actually gets a kind of happy ending I guess here. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. And if you're already subscribed, Thank you. Number 9. Green Goblin 2099 Green Goblin 2099 is also known by the name of Galactic Goblin. You might be surprised to hear that this version of Green Goblin is actually still just Norman Osborn. That's right, Norman in this version of the story survives till the year 2099. Although, to be clear, this isn't the same 2099 potential future that Miguel O'Hara hails from, known as Earth 928. Instead, this alternate future is known as Earth 2099. To maintain his youth, Norman utilized the Green Goblin serum as well as his descendants, basically sacrificing them to keep himself young. Number 8. Mongaverse Yep, Norman also has an alternate that exists in the Marvel Mongaverse. Oh boy, if you can believe that. The Mangaverse is exactly what it sounds like, a Marvel reality where everything is mangafied from the stories to the characters to the dialogue right down to the art. At least that's the intention here. The Earth is known as Earth 2301. Norman Osborn here is still the head of Oscorp but is also a leader of a group known as the Graffiti Ninja who he uses to help him 
him carry out his less than legal business in the world of crime. I'm not entirely sure, but I think this group is similar to the Shadow Clan in this universe in that they are also, I think, a bunch of ninjas. They would also be attached to the mystical world through their connection to Norman as well, who in this reality possesses magic and magical abilities, basically acting as like a sorcerer. Green Goblin can also don his mask in this reality to summon demons, which also increases his power levels. Number 7, The Fairy Gob Mother. Oh my goodness, I just love the whole design and idea behind this character, so cool. This version of Norman Osborn hails from the Edge of the Spider-Verse comic, which I already knew I needed to read and get caught up on, but now I definitely need to do that ASAP because this character just has me being like, I need to read this story. The Fairy Gob Mother is known as Norma, and in her universe of Earth 423, she is the godmother of Princess Petra, who actually inherits her spider-like powers from making a deal with Norma, with Petra becoming the hero known as Spinstress. I gotta say, the design for both of these characters is straight fire. We really only see the fairy godmother in the 2022 Edge of the Spider-Verse series in issue number 4, and then once more again in the 2023 Edge of the Spider-Verse in issue number 2. At least thus far. But I'm hoping we might see more of this character and Princess Petra as time goes on. Number 6, Goblin God. This is the version of Green Goblin who hails from the MC2 reality of Earth 982. For those who are unfamiliar with this Earth, this is an alternate reality where Peter and Mary Jane were actually permitted to grow up, settle down, get married, and stay married, and ended up having a family. It's a legacy based world where heroes actually age and retire with time actually moving forward, and their kids and other young heroic protégés taking over. Goblin God in this reality took Peter and MJ's daughter but did not harm her and instead ended up cloning her. In a final fight against Spider-Man, Peter lost his leg and Norman presumably lost his life, having been in the crossfire of one of his own pumpkin bombs. His grandson, Normie Osborn, goes on to become the new Green Goblin here, initially starting out as a villain but quickly becoming sort of an ally and confidant to Spider-Man's daughter, May, who is also known as the hero Spider-Girl and later as Spider-Woman. Number 5, Orbis Stellaris. Orbis Stellaris is another of Mr. Sinister's Clones. This clone actually has some reason to believe they are the original Sinister, considering they actually do look the most like the original Nathaniel Essex. However, even this clone is still not he. Orbis Stellaris is more obsessed with solving the evolutionary problem of AI and machines conquering the Earth by looking to the stars. This clone is known as the Clone of Spades, thanks to the mark on his forehead. And he focuses more on alien life forms and DNA and cosmic computing, believing that through this research, he will be the one to solve the evolutionary problem presented to him by the original Essex. Number 4, House of M. Mr. Sinister also had a role to play in the House of M reality and timeline. Here, he is still sporting a super amazing cape and possibly an even more insane pair of gauntlets and an even more wild and extreme collar than ever before. He is very much rocking the metallic look here. Sinister in this reality is focused on playing catch up as the mutant population has defied all of his estimates, growing even bigger than he imagined it would be at this current point in history. Probably because Scarlet Witch willed it to be so, as this was a reality that was created and manipulated by her. Hence why he would have never predicted this happening. In an attempt to catch up, Sinister creates a mutant child who he hopes will one day become the heart, soul, and savior of the entire planet. The child's name? Nathan, of course. Number 3, Dr. Stasis. Dr. Stasis was the first of the four clones of Sinister, outside of the clone of Diamonds, aka Mr. Sinister, who this list is based around that we'd come to know. We always thought Mr. Sinister was Nathaniel Essex, but it turns out even he was a clone. And in fact, there were others out there that were actually made at the same time, each representing a different suit in a deck of cards. Dr. Stasis is known as the clone of clubs, marked by the symbol on his forehead. He is determined to solve the evolution problem of AI and machines rising to ultimate power above all other species and groups by using human experimentation. While Mr. Sinister focuses more on mutant DNA, Stasis focuses instead on human DNA. He actually even thinks mutants are like kind of gross. He's like, I'm all about humans, baby. Number two, Baron Sinister. One of my favorite versions of Sinister, especially in terms of his look, but also in terms of his behavior. I always imagined this Sinister very much with my Sinister voice. Hmm, it's me, Mr. Sinister. This version of Sinister is the alternate version who hails from Doctor Doom's smashed up patchwork reality known as 
Battle World. Battle World came to be after the incursions came to a conclusion, with every universe basically smashing into one another in the Marvel multiverse, thereby destroying them all and all of their inhabitants. Doom was the one to save the Marvel multiverse from certain destruction by confronting the Beyonders and ultimately becoming the ruler of this new world, using an insane amount of reality warping power taken from Molecule Man to reform everything and basically like hold it together. Baron Sinister is the version of Sinister he created who rules over his own domain in God Emperor Doom's battle world, which is known as Bar Sinister. Number one. Mr. Sinister, Mr. Sinister himself. As in Nathaniel Essex, and with him, the original Mr. Sinister that he became is now long dead and gone. Technically, even Mr. Sinister is an alternate. Although at this point, based on how much we've seen him, now that we know the full retcon history of his other clone's origins, he would be considered the original in terms of just how much he appears in the comics as the main Essex and Sinister, but he isn't. However, yeah, that being said, the Mr. Sinister we know from the comics himself could even be a clone, as it's become unclear how many times Sinister has cloned himself, and even he seems to be uncertain at times if he is the original or if he's a clone. And even then, he's technically a clone of another clone. You know what I mean? It's just clones on clones on clones. Number 10, The Spider. The Spider is basically an alternate version of Carnage that combines his character with that of Spider-Man's Peter Parker. He made his first appearance in Exiles issue number 12 in 2002, and hails from the reality of Earth-15. Here, the Spider is not a hero, but a villain who was incarcerated for his crimes. Like Cletus, the Spider was also a redhead and also a mass murderer. What is it with redheads being presented as murderers or folks who are prone to extreme darkness in stories? He possessed the same powers as our 616's Carnage, but also combined with Spider-Man's powers, making him potentially even more deadly. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know by clicking that like button. Seriously, it does help us out. Number 9, Avengers Alliance. When it comes to the Carnage from Avengers Alliance, there are quite a few people that love this version of Carnage. Really, he's pretty much still the same old classic Cletus Cassidy, but I think the design and artwork here is what puts people over the moon for him in the game, or in the game that used to exist. Also, I think most people just miss the days of the Avengers Alliance game, since that game is no longer active. In the game, Carnage was firmly established as being more powerful as both Venom and Spider-Man, and even the two of them combined. While Avengers Avengers Alliance is no longer available to play after being shut down in 2016, Marvel Strike Force is available and is also a turn-based strategy game with its own Carnage, if you are one of the folks who missed the Alliance days. Honestly, it sounds like Marvel Strike Force is basically like what replaced it. Number 8, Maximum Carnage. Carnage has become so iconic as a character that obviously he doesn't just exist in the comics and the animated series and even in live action. He also has shown up in various video games as well, including the Maximum Carnage video game from way back in the 90s. Yeah, he's been doing video games for a long time. Oh boy, what a time that game was. This side-scrolling adventure had you playing as the various heroes from the comics in an attempt to take down villains Carnage, Shriek, and Demogoblin, Doppelganger, and Carrion. The game, like the comic book storyline of the same name, is iconic, beginning with Carnage's escape from prison and with him teaming up with Shriek. They then go on to run into Doppelganger, who they kind of adopt into their group, with Shriek kind of treating Doppelganger like uh, he's their child. Carnage here decides to go on the offensive after his escape from prison, hoping to take his fight in this side-scrolling world straight to Spider-Man and Venom. And that's where you as the player come in, obviously. Number seven, Let There Be Carnage. Was Woody Harrelson a weird choice in terms of the casting of Cletus Cassidy? A little bit. But was there potential there? Most definitely. Woody Harrelson is one of those performers where I generally tend to really enjoy his performances. And I think he does unhinged characters pretty well, honestly. So there was a lot of potential when it came to him taking on the role in Sony's sequel to Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Also, Andy Serkis directing, I thought that would be a good time. Unfortunately, that film just, in my opinion, was not very good. The corny elements were just too overwhelming for me to really enjoy it, although I do still think it had some value in terms of just like pure, raw entertainment. If you want to be entertained, it'll probably do that for you. I think it's always hard when you're bringing a character like Carnage to live action though, because it makes everything that he is so much more real. It's hard for you to connect with someone like Cletus, so you either have to make him the best bad guy around and make him really, really terrible and unrelatable, which is usually done really well in the comics, I'd say, or you have to build some kind of bridge for the audience to connect with him. Which honestly, good luck in that regard. And I do think the movie kind of tries to do that a little bit and 
it's a disservice, I think, a little. Still, it was cool to see the attempt, and I did like some of the stuff that they did with him in terms of the approaches to the fights and, you know, his views of the world. Number 6. Spider Carnage For a brief time, Ben Riley was actually Carnage, or a version of Carnage, rather. He became known as Spider Carnage. This happened after the Carnage symbiote had escaped Ravencroft. Ben Riley actually chose, as Spider-Man, to put himself in the path of Carnage, sacrificing himself to bond with it so that he could protect others from the sadistic symbiote. He was like, I will be the only one, that way no one else will be hurt by it. However, this wouldn't last too long, only a few issues. John Jameson, son of J. Jonah Jameson, would help to free Ben Riley's Spider-Man by targeting him with microwave radiation. Actually, that would really hurt. I would not want to be microwaved. Still, the idea of Carnage wielding Ben Riley is pretty cool to me. While Carnage is definitely one of the most evil Spider-Man villains around, he also happens to be one of the most powerful symbiotes as well, with his strength at times rivaling even that of Venom. In fact, I would say most, most days it's rivaling Venom. Maybe not now, but in the past for sure. Number 5. Patton Parnell Patton Parnell has to be one of my favorite of the evil alternate Spider-Men out there, and I think he would make a bomb villain in Across the Spider-Verse Part 1, especially if we get some kind of League of Evil Spider-Men. Patton Parnell is the alternate Spider-Man from Earth 51412. Like the Spider who is on Part 1 of our list, Parnell also has some sociopathic tendencies and enjoys recreational activities like burning ants with a magnifying glass. He ends up becoming a Spider-Man in a more literal sense, becoming a spider-like monstrosity who is also capable of laying eggs, as his uncle Ted, who also appears to mistreat young Patton, finds out. Rather than Patton Parnell having an origin story of fantasy and heroism, his origin is basically more like a horror story, where Patton ends up as a murderous, monstrous, spider-like villain who develops a taste for human flesh and terrorizes his next door neighbor and crush, Sarah Jane. Number 4. Tyler Stone We talked about Alchemex, the villainous future corporation on the part 1 to our list, and even an alternate video game reality where Peter ends up as the man behind that corporation, but we have yet to focus on the vice president of Alchemex's R&D department in the main 2099 reality of Earth 9. To eight, Tyler Stone. Tyler Stone is not only VP of Research and Development at Alchemex, but also is secretly Miguel O'Hara's biological father. Tyler Stone had an affair with the wife of one of his employees, Conchata, who is Miguel's mother. Miguel doesn't learn until later on that he is the son of Stone and ends up on the staff of Alchemex, working as a brilliant geneticist for them. When he tries to leave, however, it is Stone who slips him the highly addictive drug only made by Alchemex known as Rapture to prevent him from leaving. Fortunately, Miguel manages to free himself via experimentation, which also gives him spider-like powers and abilities, becoming Spider-Man 2099. Number 3. Spider Carnage Similar to the spider on part 1 of our list, Spider Carnage is another evil alternate version of Peter Parker. Or at least… He thinks he's Peter Parker. Spider Carnage came into being following Miles Warren cloning Peter. In this reality, Peter lost his Uncle Ben and later also his Aunt May, which left him completely broken hearted. His state of mind was only made worse when he was made to believe the version who had escaped Miles, dyeing his hair blonde and taking up the name Ben Riley, might actually be the true Peter Parker, with Peter potentially being the clone. This revelation filled Peter with hatred for Ben, and would later fuel the bond he had with the Carnage symbiote, who entered into his world via an interdimensional portal during a time when Peter fought Ben. His rage and the symbiote turned him into a villain known as Spider Carnage, and his plan was to destroy all realities across the multiverse. This version of Spider Carnage appeared in the 90s animated Spider-Man television series. Number 2. Red Goblin Red Goblin isn't necessarily an alternate variant considering he is the main reality 616 Norman Osborn, but Superior Spider-Man is also technically Earth 616's Otto Octavius, and I counted him last time without much complaints, so I figured we could put Red Goblin on this list and it should be fine. Red Goblin is a villain that comes from a period in Marvel Comics where a depowered Norman Osborn ended up getting his hands on the Carnage symbiote and convincing it to bond with him. With both of them bonding over how they enjoyed hurting and tormenting people. Yikes. 
The Carnage symbiote also helped to cure Norman Osborn of the antidote that was blocking him from using the Goblin Serum to regain his previous power set. So this version comes with both the powers of Carnage and those of Green Goblin. Plus you get the brilliant and twisted minds of Norman and Carnage combined. Who doesn't want Red Goblin? He's such a cool villain. Put him in across the Spider-Verse! Number 1. Evil Spider-Man Army with the potential for characters like Pat and Parnell, Spider Carnage, Earth 65's Lizard, Ultimatum, Superior Spider Man, The Spider, and Peter Parker 2099 to show up, it seems plausible that we could get a whole evil Spider Man army, or evil Spider army, in Across the Spider Verse. I don't know about you, but I'd love to see some evil Spider Men team up to take on the heroic spider folks we've come to know and love from the previous film and beyond in the comics. I think that would be super cool. The reality is in the multiverse, we don't even need an external threat. The threat could simply be Spider Man himself, considering there are so many great evil possibilities that appear throughout the catalog of Marvel's multiversal realities. At number 10 is Phoenix Force Magneto. In this reality, Magneto merged with the fiery cosmic force, forging a fearsome union. His quest to mold Hope Summers into a Phoenix host underscored his unrelenting will, defying warnings from the Avengers and X Men alike. Yet this fusion spiraled into chaos, necessitating a coalition from Charles. Charles Xavier, the Hulk, and Wolverine to quell the cataclysm. The prospect of a Phoenix Magneto conjures an ominous blend, melting two extremes, the cosmic Phoenix Force and Magneto's unyielding darkness. Unlike others, Magneto swiftly succumbed to the Force's corrupting influence, illuminating his inherent malevolence. This accelerated plunge led to a world-shattering clash, sparing only Wolverine through Jean Grey's timely intervention. In a universe where Magneto harnesses the Phoenix, a realm engulfing menace emerges. In defeat, this fusion echoes a staggering potency and unbridled havoc they embody, weaving a tale of mutant and cosmic might on an unprecedented scale. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. At number 9 is Juggernautical. Juggernaut as a massive boat. Uh, yeah, the multiverse is weird, you guys. Anyways, the Juggernautical, the seafaring behemoth, is unlike any other. See, this colossal ship being was no ordinary vessel. It was the marionette of a mystical book, a navigator of the arcane. But as fate would have it, this enigmatic tomb found its way into the clutches of none other than Admiral Harry Greich, a high-breaking officer of the Royal Navy. A perfect storm brewed as the Juggernautical set its course upon the Exiles, a group tasked with mending the threads of the multiverse, and the Juggernautical even crossed paths with the infamous Blackbeard. Yet, the winds of fortune are ever fickle. In a cinematic clash, Blink emerged as the hero of this otherworldly seafaring saga. With a flicker of teleportation mastery, she wrestled control of the book from the Greich's grasp and in an act of defiance, hurled it into the abysmal depths of the ocean. At number 8 is Sabretooth. I mean, it's a team up of Sabretooths from across the multiverse, so I'm calling the team the Sabretooth. In an alternate reality, a ferocious female Sabretooth is abducted by Graydon Creed, who's on a mission to eradicate versions of Sabretooth across the multiverse. She's imprisoned with other Sabretooths, all of whom have their power suppressed. Together they break free, confront Graydon, and after a fierce battle, banish him through a portal. United by their experience, they opt to stay in Earth 616, seizing a spaceship to embark on their own interdimensional adventure. At number 7 is Baron Sinister. Welcome to Battle World, the tapestry of twisted domains where alternate realities collide. Among these shards of existence, we find the enigmatic Baron Sinister ruling over his own dominion. Bar Sinister, a realm inhabited by clones and created by the tyrant's hand. But clones can't be the only thing on this villain's menu, as he keeps a select few non-clones as playthings for his whims. Now Sinister and King Hyperion, two formidable forces, conspire against the House of Braddock of Higher Avalon. Exposed and accused of discord, Sinister Sinister faced trial under the gaze of God Emperor Doom's enforcers. A duel between Baron Sinister and Baron Braddock then ensued. Amidst the crumbling Doom's rule, Sinister, edged on by Captain Marvel, joined the rebellion, leading to clashes and a betrayal that culminated in his demise at the hands of Baron Apocalypse. At number 6 is Dark Phoenix Mystique. So this Mystique story is pretty familiar, shadowing the path of her mainstream self up until King Loki decides to give his brother Thor a run from his money with a Harley dose of suffering. During all this, Mystique decides it's time to settle her score with none other than Logan, aka Wolverine. She whips out this Phoenix Blaster, yeah, you heard me right, stealing away the Phoenix Force from him and spreading his body parts across the vast expanse of the multiverse. Her stint as the Dark Phoenix lands her a recruitment offer from the Multiversal Masters of Evil. These folks go on a multi-reality rampage, taking out prehistoric heroes left and right. Cue the showdown as they target Earth 616 prehistory. The prehistoric Avengers then team up with time-traveling counterparts for a nine-day cosmic brawl. But ultimately, Dark Phoenix Mystique faces her reckoning, confronting the forces of creation and meeting her end in the torrent of the 
the first firmament. Number five, Superior Spider Man. Superior Spider Man is a version of Spider Man who is also Dr. Otto Octavius. Let me explain. Back in the 616 comic book continuity, Otto is basically dying and manages to trick Peter into a body swap scenario. While Peter is trapped inside Otto's failing body and dies, Otto lives on in Peter's body as Spider Man. Superior Spider Man, to be exact. Because, you know, this is Otto, so he's like, I'm gonna be the best Spider Man ever. Peter would eventually return, and Otto would also go back to his usual. Doc Ock appearance and his hijinks, but for a time, he was the Spider Man of the 616 reality. He's done good and bad things before in the comics and ended up accidentally bringing back the Inheritors after they were defeated the first time in Spider Verse. Oops. Superior Spider Man, while known for being a villain, is also like an anti hero, so we could really see him in either light were he to show up in Across the Spider Verse Part 1. But yeah, he's been a villain and a hero, so I figured I could still count him as a villain for this list. I just really want Superior Spider Man. Man. I think a lot of us do. Number four, Army of Doc Ox. Why stop at one? Or I guess two Doc Ox when we could have a whole army of them, right? I mean, there isn't just Doc Ock, Otto Octavius somewhere out there. We also have Olivia Liv, Octavius's version, and we could have Superior Spider-Man as well. There are lots of cool alternates of Otto out in the multiverse that we could meet in Across the Spider-Verse, and Doc Ock is such a powerful and interesting villain that we could have a whole army of them to face. I'm not sure what the motivation would be or like who would ultimately be the Doc Ock in charge, the like head Doc Ock, maybe superior, but I'm sure when all those octopi put their minds and I guess their tentacles together, they could come up with some pretty ingenious schemes. Also, I feel like now that I said put their tentacles together, I'm like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but uh, I said it. And you know what? Sometimes you gotta be like all tentacles in and then get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Number three, the spider. The spider is one of the worst alternate versions of Spider-Man we've ever met. He is super evil and is basically a version of Peter Parker that is combined with Cletus Cassidy. This alternate version of Peter Parker has red hair and was born a sociopath. Cause I guess everyone that has red hair is a sociopath. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand that connection, but you know, people with red hair, apparently they have no souls. He possesses a dark sense of humor and enjoys causing pain to others. He first showed up in the Exile series and hails from Earth 15. Like Carnage on Earth 616, he revels in hurting others. He possesses a symbiote very similar to Carnage, although it is actually known as the Spider symbiote instead of the Carnage symbiote in this reality. What could be cooler than seeing Miles and the rest of the Spider Army take on an alternate and evil version of Peter Parker? Also, Let There Be Carnage did well at the box office, right? I'm pretty sure it did. So wouldn't it make sense to have some kind of version of Carnage show up here? And this is like both. It's like a Spidey and a Carnage together. Number two, Morlin. I'm actually a really big fan of Morlin, even though I feel like he's not really everybody's cup of tea. He's my cup of tea. I like the fact that he's a Victorian style energy vampire from an alternate past. Morlin feeds on the energy of spider totems, hunting them down and feeding off of them. He is extremely powerful by himself and is sometimes not even just a one energy vampire kind of deal. So sometimes if you're facing Morlin, it's not just Morlin you're facing. Morlin has proven to be a hard foe to beat, especially because he rarely stays is dead for long and usually shows back up to torment Spider-Man and taunt him, often threatening that he will be his end. Morlin is also the guy who ate Spider-Man's eye that one time when he was on the brink of death, plagued by a mysterious ailment. Number one, the Inheritors. The Inheritors are the rest of Morlin's crew and family. They are a powerful energy vampire clan which hunt down various totems and consume them. Because yeah, there aren't just spider totems out there apparently. There's lots of other totems. Spider totems Totems, by the way, if you're confused by what what that means, are basically spider folks from across the multiverse who are destined to end up being connected to the spirit of the spider, either possessing powers related to spiders or some other important connection, which generally gives them purpose in their life. The inheritors ended up getting control over the master weaver, thereby turning him into an enemy of the spider totems, even though that wasn't his intended purpose to begin with. They used the master weaver's knowledge and power to travel the multiverse and hunt down spider totems totems within it. The inheritors are generally led by Solus or Morlin, and their members have included Verna, Genix, Karn, Bora, Brix, Dora, Deimos, Malos, Morcia, Namura, and Thanos. And I probably said some of those wrong, so sorry about that. Like Morlin, they are also from the alternate reality of Earth 001. And in case you didn't know, the inheritors were kind of like the main thing when we had Spider-Verse in the comics and then Spider-Geddon. So it would make sense that they would show up at some point in these movies. Please. I would like to see it. Maybe I'm the only one. 
I don't know. Number 10, All Father Doom. This is the Doom of 2099 who would become known as All Father Doom. He made his first full appearance in Doom 2099 issue number 1 after previously appearing in Marvel Comics Presents issue 118 in a preview. Doom's origins are pretty wild in this universe to be honest. The reality of Earth 928. Initially, he woke up to the year 2099, he was in pain, and he seemed to have no clear recollection of all the years that had passed prior to him waking. He simply knew who he was and what that meant. Seeking out his nation of Latveria, Doom discovered upon returning to the capital that someone else now ruled the nation in his stead, a cyborg known as Tiger Wild. Initially, Doom failed to best Wild in combat in his attempt to win back his throne. However, this is Doom we're talking about and eventually, he would concoct a plan that would successfully allow him to reclaim his place as a ruler, reclaiming the love of his people and defeating Wild for once and for all. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that like button? Just give it a little, little click. Woo! Number 9. What if Invisible Girl of the Fantastic Four married the Submariner? This version of Doom hails from a reality where Spider-Man was given permission to join the Fantastic Four, with the team becoming renamed as the Fantastic Five for a period. As a result of this, Susan Storm also left the team to be with Namor, breaking Reed's heart. Here, Doom was more easily defeated by the team now that Spider-Man had joined their ranks. While I'm sure this might sound disappointing to other Doctor Doom fans out there, don't be too disappointed by this loss because this Doctor Doom of 772 would also go on to be chosen to set out to protect time. At first at the behest of the Whisperer, who actually turned out to be the villainous Kang alternate Immortus, and later in a bid to help stop Immortus and the Time Twisters, chosen to do so again by the Time Variance Authority, or as we fondly know them now, the TVA. Number 8, Doominator. In the reality of Earth 691, Doom actually was an ally to heroes in a battle to defend this Earth against the Martian Master. A millennia later, it was revealed that Doom, long thought dead, was actually, somehow, still alive. Now how did he do this? Well, he had taken the place of Wolverine, successfully killing Logan, and then putting his own brain inside Logan's adamantium coated skeleton, thereby taking control of Logan's form while also prolonging Doom's own life. Later, Rancor would end up traveling to Earth, seeking out her ancestor Wolverine. Rancor and a disguised Doom both agreed to work together initially, but it was later revealed that Rancor had never really intended to actually follow through and actually planned on betraying Doom by attacking him, with him later revealing to her the truth of his identity once she had turned. Also to be clear, I'm calling this character Doominator myself because it kinda looks like the Terminator in that adamantium coated skeleton. <laughs> but that is not an official name or an editorial name used for this character, just when I chose myself. Number 7, Age of Apocalypse. In the Age of Apocalypse reality of Earth 295, Doom is still the ruler of Latveria. He obviously rules one of the few places that initially Apocalypse does not yet control here. Apocalypse first conquers the US in this reality and Doom is one of the surviving humans who attempts to actually come together with other people to stop Apocalypse from fully taking over the world. He becomes the director of the Eurasian security for the Human High Council, but ends up being tricked into a meeting with Mikhail Rasputin that is really part of a plan to try and conquer the human race. Mikhail is hoping to basically convert humans into cyborgs that he could then use to fight against Apocalypse himself. This version of Doom isn't so much a straight up villain anymore as he's one of the people who actually stands up against Apocalypse, the true villain on this alternate earth and in its story. Number 6, Emperor Von Doom. This is always a weird one to me. This version of Doom comes from one of the versions of Earth that are glimpsed in the Marvel novel trilogy The Chaos Engine. In the book X-Men slash Doctor Doom, The Chaos Engine, we visit Earth 892, where Doom, using the Cosmic Cube, is able to rule over Earth. In this story, three different villains get their hands on the Cosmic Cube, and are able to use it to rewrite history to basically create their own alternate Earths. In the reality that Doom rules, Earth 892, he has convinced Storm to join him as his wife and Empress. Together, the couple also have two children, a son and a daughter. I know, surprise. I mean, they do have chemistry, but I don't feel like Storm would ever marry Doom in the main continuity. Number five, Naranasaurman. Naranasaurman is the dinosaur version of Norman Osborn from Earth 66. That's right, he's got a dinosaur alternate. If you were curious to learn more about him, I would highly recommend checking out Edge of Spider Verse issue number one, where he made his first and only appearance. Naranasaurman is, of course, a Tyrannosaurus Rex who enjoys preying on smaller, weaker dinos like 
Ter Tarker, a pterodon. Man, who, who doesn't love dinosaur versions of characters? I know I do. Both Pater and Norin were the, in the middle of a fight when they were struck by an alien spider infested meteor which had fallen to Earth. The collision caused them to swap bodies and also left Tur, now in Norin's body, with spider like abilities and powers. Tragically, this one issue that Norin appears in is probably all we will get to see of him based on what happens in this story. That's all I'm going to say about that. Number four, Goblin Gwen. Not an official editorial name or used for her currently, I don't think, but just a name that fits with the current way that we tend to name our alternate Gwens in the Marvel multiverse. Currently, in her reality of her 3109, Gwen was known simply as Green Goblin or just Gwen Stacy. This character makes her first appearance in Spider Gwen Ghost Spider issue number one from 2018. Here we learn that this version of the character actually started out as a hero, fighting side by side with this universe's Spider Man, Harry Osborn. After the death of both Harry and losing her father, George Stacy, Gwen's goblin persona takes hold of her, successfully becoming her dominant persona for years, until Ghost Spider, Gwen Stacy of Earth 65, arrived and was able to help Goblin Gwen's friends, Mary Jane and Peter Parker, track her down so that they could cure her. Number three, President Ozzy Osbourne. President Osbourne hails from the same Earth as everyone's favorite new Spider-Man from across the Spider-Verse, Spider-Punk, and one of my favorite alternate spider folks for years. In this reality, Norman is known as Ozzy Osbourne, Norman Ozzy Osbourne. In this reality, his company Oscorp created Venom. Spider-Punk defeated him in the midst of a riot using some amps and an electric guitar. He really is the coolest, honestly. Despite the fact that it had seemed that Spider-Punk had pretty permanently, I'll say, defeated Osbourne by, well, separating his head from his body, in reality, Norman still lived, but secretly ran the country from behind the scenes, letting everyone else believe he was really gone to help strengthen his position as his demise had left him a martyr in the eyes of the people. President Osborne would return with a robotic body to fight against not just Spider Punk, but also his fellow allies, Captain Anarchy, Riot Heart, and Kamala Khan. Number two, Ultimate Green Goblin. Ultimate Green Goblin hails from the universe of Earth 1610, also known as the Ultimate Universe. Named after the line of comics it appeared in, which it's Itself was named after the Ultimates, this universe's version of the Avengers team, although they also have an Avengers team as well, but that team is kind of more like DC's Suicide Squad in terms of makeup and purpose, so although it's named the Avengers, it's only really in name alone. In this universe, Green Goblin is a lot more physically intimidating, more beast-like or demonic in appearance, with giant muscles, giant arms, and giant feet. Still, this version of Green Goblin is also Norman Osborn, founder and CEO of Oscorp. Norman in this reality surmised that because an Oz formula altered Spider had basically given Spider-Man his abilities and powers that he himself could use the same formula mixed with his own DNA to become a superior version of himself. However, clearly this backfired, instead transforming Norman into a big green monster. Maybe because inside he is a big green monster, who knows. Number one, Raimiverse. I mean, probably one of the best versions of Norman Osborn out there is Willem Dafoe's interpretation of the character for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man films. I love that this version of the character has become so iconic, despite the fact that Willem Dafoe really only played Green Goblin and Norman Osborn in that first film. At least, you know, while the character was alive. After that, it is just the ghost of Norman who basically haunts his son Harry, demanding that he avenge him. I think I love the fact that mainly this Norman is only featured in the first film and yet his presence just lingers throughout really this entire franchise, really based mainly on his performance just in that first film alone. Willem Dafoe just also feels like a perfect cast for that role and clearly understood the depth to this character, cementing him as a villain that feels surprisingly real for a guy that dresses up as a goblin like it's Halloween and flies around on a glider throwing little explosive pumpkins down at his enemies. I mean, that all sounds pretty ridiculous. And yet Willem Dafoe has convinced me it's serious business in those movies. Serious business, but also sometimes silly. You can be both. Number 10, 1602 Spider-Man. In part one of this list, we mentioned Spider-Man 2099. So for part two, we had to wind it back a little bit. Peter Parqua, fancy name, first appeared in Marvel 1602 issue one. But it wasn't until a couple years later in New World issue four, where he was introduced as the Spider. Peter Parqua didn't have any powers per se, but he still got the job done. 
for Fury. <clears throat> Sorry, Royal Spy Master Nicholas Fury, that is. <laughs> now, I love this version of Pete quite a bit because there's these odd looking spiders that you're expecting that are going to bite him, and then he's gonna turn to the webhead, but it just doesn't happen. It gets so close, and then he's like, yeah, I'm a normal guy. It's great, it teases you, so fun. So this Spider-Man is, yes, of course, a little bit weaker than our 616 webhead, but I'll give him bonus points because of the ruffles. And also, no goggles either. This dude's eyes must be so dry. Number nine, Spider-Man Noir. Bumping the clocks ahead to the year 1933, the Great Depression doesn't seem like an appropriate time to do backflips and webbing people up, but the 2008 four-part miniseries finds one of the coolest versions of Peter Parker for sure. Nicolas Cage voiced this version of Spidey in Sony's Spider-Verse film, and I gotta say, they kind of nailed it. His origins are more or less the same. Norman Osborn is a shady mayor this time around, and the way Spider-Man fights crime is so extra, I gotta admit. When I read noir, I always read Spider-Man Spider-Man's voice in the same voice as like Jackie Earl Haley's Rorschach. I don't know, it's so fitting and smoky. It's definitely a vibe, that's for sure. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be extremely helpful for our channel. You're the best, thank you so much for your support. Let's get right back to this list, shall we? Number eight. Arachnite. Coming at you live from Warp World, one of the most out there versions of Peter Parker hit the page in Infinity Wars issue three. Moon Knight and Spider-Man are gearing up. They're making a game plan to take down Gamora. And Spider-Man says, just punch whoever I punch in a second. Awesome, great deal. Now that turns out to be a lot harder than imagined when the both of them merge together. Alongside Arachnite, we got to meet Ghost Panther, Soldier Supreme, Iron Hammer, and more. Now Peter's mind was also separated into four different personalities like Moon Knight, each desiring dominance of his body. So there's Science Pete, the Knight, of course, the friendly neighborhood arachnid, and for when it comes to signing those checks, CEO Peter. A combination of darts and webs ought to get the job done as well. Number seven, Spider Kid. Making his first appearance in Spider Force issue one, Earth 218 Peter's childhood is actually a little darker, believe it or not. Both of his parents passed away in a car crash tragically, and Uncle Ben was much more different after that. He was a mean old man. He was abusive to Peter, so much so that Peter actually scrapped the family name. He started going by Charlie Parker. Charlie was a troubled kid naturally. It wasn't his fault at all, but he had to spend two years at the Administration for Child Services and then two more years at Horizon Juvenile Detention Center. Now his powers didn't arrive until he was 13 after that. And then he had to bust dealers just to get by. Charlie was recruited into the Superior Spider Army by Ashley Barton, who would call Charlie Grandpa because of the resemblance of her grandfather Pete from her reality. I love Grandpa Pete's style. The exposed arms, gotta admit, Pretty badass. Number six, spiders, man. And now onto something a little more, um, I don't know, disgusting, perhaps? Spider-Man of Earth 11580 is actually Spider's man. He's made of a thousand spiders that work together. Hive mind status. So, so gross. See, before the incident, Peter and Gwen were visiting Horizon Labs, and instead of one spider coming down, taking a bite of Peter, he actually fell into a pit of radioactive spiders where they consumed him. But he didn't go. See, his consciousness was actually spread out within all of these thousands of spiders. So much worse, way worse, I would say. Even on the cover of spider Get in issue three, it grosses me out. You see all of them and they're great, all the different alternate Spider-Mans, and then you see him and his mask is ripped. There's spiders coming out. Like, no, I don't want your help. I want anybody's help but you, go away. He's actually quite similar to Carl King, who came around in comics much earlier with Spider-Man's Tangled Web issue one. Only he was a bully in Peter's class who was obsessed with getting the same powers as Spider-Man. So he ate the dead spider that initially bit Peter and then ended up in a similar conundrum. I'd rather eat the spider than be consumed by thousands of them. Everybody's turning into spiders, like it's a fun thing. That's a hard pass. I'd rather just not have superpowers. Number five, Jean Grey or 7642. This alternate version of Jean comes to us from a Marvel and DC crossover universe assigned the number Earth 7642. In fact, after her initial appearance, Jean from this universe would also appear in stories pertaining to her past in a crossover with the Wildcats, who were over at Image at the time. So just all the crossovers, really. In this reality, Jean does become the Dark Phoenix, wipes out a star, and then takes her own life. Life, much like in the main continuity version of the story. But instead of that not being the real Jean and learning that she was actually alive but hidden underwater, in 
this universe, Jean is resurrected by Darkseid, who intends to use her in his pursuit of the anti-life equation. The Teen Titans and the X-Men team up to defeat Darkseid and Jean, who then recovers her memory of her life before she was Dark Phoenix and turns on Darkseid, once more sacrificing herself to save everyone else. Ain't that just the way? Number 4. Apocalypse In Age of Apocalypse in the reality of Earth 295, Jean ends up eventually taking on the mantle of Apocalypse. While she perished in this reality shortly after that happened, it's basically because she sacrificed herself in order to protect other people. As I said, that always happens. Jean Grey was so powerful as Apocalypse that she even managed to hold on to her own personality, but she could feel that influence of her new role working to change her, as she expressed that she did feel intensely arrogant, which might also be why she was cool going out the way that she did in the end. Cause you know, I feel like Jean wouldn't want to be fully taken over by that, that force. Number 3. God Level Phoenix This version of Jean comes to us from one of the short stories featured in X-Men Millennial Visions 2000. In the story by the maker, we learn that Jean is one of the few to survive both Deathbird and Magneto's attack. Unable to stand against them as they are, the X-Men turn to a device Forge created to evolve them further, giving them basically godlike abilities. Or raising their abilities to become godlike, perhaps I should say. Jean, as her power-up, gains full and complete control over the Phoenix, making her more powerful than ever before. Definitely not a hero you'd want to go up against, though I honestly wouldn't want to go up against Rogue either in this reality, who you just need to be within a mile of to have your powers and life energy drained, which sounds pretty scary. At least if she has any skin exposed. Number 2. Zorn While she might not have gone dark or taken the powers of Apocalypse, Jean as Zorn from the alternate reality of Earth 13729 is just all around one of the most powerful genes in the multiverse, in my humble opinion. Her powers are like her main counterpart but improved, making her one of the strongest all around alternates out there. Of course, even then, like most alternate versions of Jean, and even main Jean, Zorn still perished in the end. In X-Men Battle of the Atom issue number 2, we learn that Jean's powers are so great that not even she can apparently handle them, and during the all out brawl with all the other X-Men and alternate X-Men, she overloads and ends up exploding, creating a massive explosion all around her and leaving nothing left of her own corpse except for her Zorn mask. Number 1. Phoenix slash Dark Phoenix I really wanted to make Zorn my number 1 most powerful alternate Jean, but then I remembered that technically both Phoenix and the Dark Phoenix personas we saw in the comics were not really Jean in the main continuity, which would make Phoenix an alternate as well, albeit a one who we thought at the time was the main Jean and who existed in the main continuity still, living in effect as Jean. Dark Phoenix was powerful enough to destroy a whole planet and the whole Dabari race, which I believe amounted to I think billions of lives lost. Later after sacrificing herself to save everyone from her own darkness, it was revealed that Dark Phoenix wasn't really Jean, but in fact a Jean duplicate created by the Phoenix Force which used Jean's body and mind as blueprints to create a more powerful version of her while she rested safely beneath Jamaica Bay. So Phoenix and Dark Phoenix both are Jean, but at the same time aren't, which would classify Phoenix as an alternate version technically, and definitely one of the most powerful alternates out there as such. In fact, the creation of that retcon is pretty cool because apparently that retcon had to be created because they wanted to, if they were gonna bring Jean back, make her not guilty for any of the bad stuff she did to Dark Phoenix. So they basically had to make it so that that Jean wasn't the real Jean, which is pretty. Uh, uh, pretty wild. Number 10, Gwen Vereen. Gwen Vereen is an alternate version we've really only seen briefly in Secret Wars Battle World issue number 3, but I like to imagine that she is pretty strong and also pretty cool, like many of her other amalgamated versions. Gwen is a character that we've seen become an alternate version of Spider Man and Deadpool, and both of those characters and versions of Gwen Stacy are pretty rad, I must admit. So I imagine her Wolverine version would also be tough as nails and fierce. Gwen Vereen also appeared on an alternate cover for Old Man Logan issue number 2 from 2015, with art done by Chris Samney. If that art is any indication, like her other alternate versions before her, this would probably prove to be a pretty powerful and popular alternate version of Wolverine and Gwen, if you know we saw more stuff from her. I just want to read a comic that's about all the awesome and powerful alternate Gwen versions running around in the multiverse together. Gwen Stacy's Adventure Through the Multiverse it could be called, and Gwen could wander around and meet all the alternate alternate, possibly mutant, versions of herself. Maybe they're all secretly mutants. That would be kind of cool. Just like how Deadpool or Gwenpool was secretly a mutant, maybe, or retconned herself to be a mutant. 
I love that. It's so weird. Number nine, Poison Wolverine. Poison Wolverine is the assimilated version of Wolverine from Earth 22186, who became bonded to a poison. Poisons are basically like symbiotes, except symbiotes are kind of their own thing over at Marvel, so. I guess imagine a symbiote, but it's like a different symbiotic alien race. So not a symbiote. And, and kind of pointy and sharpy instead. Are you with me at all? The poison that bonded to Wolverine and took him over would have his powers and would also be able to use his biomass to shapeshift and give itself extra appendages or tentacles as needed. So this is a version of Wolverine who isn't in control as much but does still have powers plus can also shapeshift. Sadly this version of the character did perish, not because it was defeated per se, but because the head of its hive, the Poison Queen, was vanquished. That's how it works for the poisons. Your queen is vanquished, you're dead. Number eight, Wolverham. Although he might not seem that powerful, Wolverham of reality 73174 might actually end up being one of the most powerful? He is like an alternate version of both Spider-Ham, Peter Porker, and of Wolverine. Being that he's also kind of cartoony in Origins, it's likely that his powers are similar to that of both heroes, meaning that he has probably a crazy healing factor, his adamantium claws and skeleton, and can pull up all sorts of immensely powerful cartoon antics, with cartoon physics applying to his fights and his adventures. I don't know about you, but I think having cartoon physics in play makes you pretty powerful. Cartoon physics are wacky. Number seven, Old Man Logan. Old Man Logan is still a badass who manages to get a lot done despite the fact that his healing factor sometimes struggles to keep up. In his old age, his healing factor is slowed down when we first get into Logan's future adventures in the post apocalyptic wasteland that was once Earth. However, much more later down the line, his healing factor finally picks back up again. At this time, Logan no longer goes by the name Wolverine at all and is instead known as the Hooded Man. So this version of him is kind of weaker, but also kind of the same. Either way, Old Man Logan also brings years of experience and wisdom to the table, which I think should be worth something extra when it comes to how powerful he is. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Wolverine lists, or more mutant lists in general, haha, I love writing mutant lists for you, please be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up and clicking subscribe. Do all the things, woo! Number six, Diamond Patch. Diamond Patch is the version of Wolverine from Warp World, which of course was made by Gamora when using the Infinity Stones to fold the universe in half. He is the amalgamation of Emma Frost and Wolverine, making him a pretty deadly and stylish character. His claws, instead of being adamantium, are diamond, and Diamond Patch also has a sharp eye and mind for good business ventures as well, like Emma Frost. He also seems to be able to channel his telepathic powers using his claws as well. It was also implied that in the future, Diamond Patch may potentially be destined to bond with the Phoenix Force. Ho ho! Number five. Justice Lord. Coming from the animated universe, the 2003 Justice League episode titled A Better World showed us one that's rather darker. This parallel universe showed Kal-El and the Justice Lord storming the White House. President Lex Luthor had just executed the Flash and the team wasn't too happy about it. So Batman and Wonder Woman fought off the Secret Service while Superman tells Luthor that he's taking him in. Now Lex is obviously insane, so he has a button that can just start a nuclear war if pressed. One of those easy buttons, just, you know, a nightmare. Now he's threatening Superman saying that he needs to use deadly force if he wants to save the people, so Superman does. His eyes glow red and when Batman and Wonder Woman come back in, it's too late. They can smell his corpse. It's really gross. Superman though, he was all smiles. This was just the start. Now it cuts to a couple years after this point and the Justice Lords were ruling the Earth. And of course, freedom was not included. Number four, composite Superman. Joseph Meech made his first appearance in World's Finest issue 142. He was a diver struggling to get by, so he put on this sidewalk diving show. You know, those sidewalk diving shows we always come across. He jumped from a high building into this water tank, but the water, unbeknownst to him, was actually leaking out. So when he went to jump, he almost landed in a practically empty tank, but Superman thankfully saved his life. Now on top of that, Superman even gave this guy a job. He employed him as a custodian at the Superman Museum. So Joseph was pretty bitter after this point. He had his own misfortunes, plus he's now shining Superman's cape all day. I get it. But when a lightning bolt hit the statue of the Legion of Superheroes, Joseph got all of their power somehow. 
So he used this new shape-shifting power look to look both like Batman and Superman, going by the composite Superman. So Meech would plan these situations for Batman and Superman to show up and save the day, but they were rigged to make these heroes look stupid. His powers were impressive, but not permanent. He reverted back to human form one day with no recollection of what he had done. Number three, Cyborg Superman. Hank Henshaw made his first appearance in Adventures of Superman issue 465. He was a scientist, astronaut, and team leader of the Excalibur crew. He was joined on this LexCorp space mission by his wife and two others. A lot of Fantastic Four vibes going on here, that's for sure. In fact, after the cosmic rays got to the crew, the powers were actually quite similar. Terry, Hank's wife, was essentially the invisible woman, whereas Hank, his face started to melt off. It actually ended horribly for everybody but Terry. Now Superman saved her and the others, it was too late, but in Adventures of Superman issue 468, it was revealed that Hank lived through iCloud. Yeah, basically he transferred all of his consciousness to LexCorp's mainframe, and then he took over NASA's equipment, and then he beamed his mind into the birthing matrix, the pod that carried Superman from Krypton. So now he was able to travel the cosmos and learn about other local life forms and their history. And he eventually came to the conclusion that Superman was evil and needed to be stopped. So he recruited Mongol and planned his revenge, but after Superman died battling Doomsday, Hank claimed to be the Superman reborn. Not a bad plan, so far he's killing it. Number two, Super Doom. Coming from Earth 45, this Superman was also a project gone wrong. He first appeared in Action Comics Volume 2, Issue 9, when Jimmy Olsen created a machine that could turn thoughts into reality. So the gang decided to make a robot Superman. What could go wrong, I wonder? They ended up selling this device to Overcorp, which made it into a Superman, The Last Night of Tomorrow, AKA the monstrous Super Doom. Now, Overcorp used him to take over the planet, obviously, but that still wasn't enough. Super Doom entered the bleed space and searched the multiverse for his creators, destroying planets and other versions of Superman, like Optiman of Earth 36 and Superman of Earth 42. But eventually, it came to Earth 23 and had to go against their Superman, Calvin Harris, AKA the Superman president. And if you want to know more about the president Superman, check out part one of this list after you're done, if you haven't done so already. And finally, number one, Dark Side Superman. In Superman Dark Side issue one released back in the late 90s, we see an alternate life for Kal-El when Metron intercepts his escape pod and gives the Kryptonian to Dark Side instead. There you go, enjoy. Now, it doesn't take long for Superman to then become the champion of Apocalypse. His name was instantly heard across the planet. This guy wore dark armor, he was way more brutal when it came to combat, and when he led the battle against New Genesis, he destroyed the home of the new gods. And as the planet died, the High Father told him the truth about his origins and his true prophecy, so he was then sent to Earth where he almost drowned because he was wearing all that badass armor, but luckily he was saved by a woman named Lane. Brutal origin story, but we got where we needed to be eventually. Number 10, the Batman from Red Sun. Well, we will be focusing on Batman here from Earth 30, the reality of Superman Red Sun. It should be noted that there are more and that really the symbol of Batman is what is so powerful here. However, it all started with one man who we aren't even given the true name of. We simply know him as Batman. It was his mission to take down the man responsible for his parents' murder, Pyotr Roslov. In his attempt to get to Roslov, however, he ended up being pitted against the Soviet hero Superman, aka the Red Sun. Batman almost succeeded in defeating Superman here, but Wonder Woman unexpectedly became free of her bonds, turning the tides of the fight in Superman's favor. In the end, Batman decided to take his own life rather than be captured, blowing himself up but confessing to Superman beforehand the truth about the corrupt Roslov, and in so doing, achieved his mission. While the original Batman died, others would later take his place in the fight for justice, inspired by the stories of his heroism. Number 9, Owlman. Owlman isn't a direct, alternate version of Bruce Wayne, as he's the older brother of Bruce on Earth 3, Thomas Wayne Jr., the elder son of Martha and Thomas Wayne. However, he is the equal counterpart to main continuity Bruce, considering his place on the crime syndicate as their Batman. And so, for that, we're going to include him here. When Thomas was younger, he orchestrated the death of his own parents as he believed they were squandering and mismanaging his inheritance, the family wealth. He even tried to get his younger brother, Bruce, whom he loved dearly, to join him, but Bruce actually ended up getting cold feet and Thomas as such was forced to kill him. As Owlman, Thomas is much more dangerous as he does not have the same moral code as main continuity Batman, but is at the same level when it comes to his intellect, training, and skills. 
and his plans. He's pretty good at plans too. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more powerful alternate versions of Batman, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Two bat thumbs up. Do bats have thumbs? I don't think so. They have like little fingers on their wings. I think that's what they have. <laughs> little claws. Number eight, Richard Grayson. Dick Grayson is another alternate version of Batman who took up the cape and cowl following a Batman's supposed death. Being that he's been trained and pretty much prepared to take up the mantle his whole life, being Batman's first Robin, Nightwing makes for a pretty powerful alternate Batman. Controversial opinion, perhaps, but despite his following in Batman's footsteps in terms of his moral code, I would say he is still a more powerful alternate than Owlman. I know some people might say, like, not having morals makes you more powerful, but I I, I digress. At one point, actually, he and Owlman teamed up and almost enacted a plot to take down the crime syndicate together. Dick comes with years of training and is known for his genius intellect, forensic skills, is a master martial artist, and would go on to become a very capable spy and develop espionage skills later on when he infiltrates Spiral. During his time as Batman, following the events and apparent death of Batman in Final Crisis, Grayson would fight alongside Damian Wayne, who acted as his sidekick Robin. Number seven. Father Bruce. You might refer to him as Bat Priest based on this art, but his real name is Father Bruce, and he is the head priest of the House of Milk and Honey, a new version of the Gather House. Father Bruce makes an appearance in Milk Wars, the young animals imprint crossover with the DC main world and characters. He is prominently featured in part two of the crossover in the Mother Panic and Batman special. The thing is, Father Bruce isn't really an alternate, but he's so cool and this story is just so bizarre and great that I thought we needed to mention him here. I actually checked this out and then I was like, man, I gotta read Mother Panic because I believe uh, the writer of Mother Panic is the one that, that writes this comic. I'm sorry, I don't remember their name off the top of my head, but you should check it out. Father Bruce is a version of Batman who has been twisted into a priest. Here, Father Bruce is in charge of a small army of Robins known as the Holy Sidekick Choir of Merciful Justice, who he teaches using his book of Bat Manners and Divine Wisdom. They drink the milk created by Mother Partake, who does so in an eerie manner. She kind of creates it with her fingers, it's really weird, and have their histories rewritten by a golden machine. Bruce himself is trapped here until Mother Panic, aka Violet Page, manages to free him and he returns to his old self. But even in this alternate persona, he's pretty mighty. Also in this delusional, brainwashed created reality, Bruce believes it is a priest crashing through his window, not a bat, that inspired him to take up the mantle of Father Bruce and become a priest. I just love that. I just love that he's like crashes through the window and he's like, who, who are you? And then he's like, I will become a priest as he like drinks the milk. <laughs> Oh, it's such a weird story, I like it. Number six, Man Bat Batman. Now I know Taylor on his part one had Batman, AKA Earth 43 turned vampire bats, but I figured why not bring you another vampiric version of the hero? because I also just really love vampires and they're powerful. This alternate version of Batman is not actually a Bruce Wayne alternate, but instead is an alternate version of Kirk Langstrom, who we know in the main continuity as Man Bat. Kirk Langstrom here was working on a cure for cancer, specifically lymphoma, which he himself suffered from. He didn't end up creating a serum that cured him, yay, but regrettably, due to its ties to bats, it also turned him into a pseudo vampire. As a vampire created by science, Langstrom became a part of the new superhero Holy Trinity in The Gods and Monsters. He possessed superhuman strength, durability, agility, and could fly, and also held onto his genius intellect. The one downside of his vampirism was that he did require blood in order to live. Comparable, but somewhat different to Marvel's Morbius, who is also known as a pseudo vampire. Number five, Wolverina. Wolverina is the female version of Wolverine and cousin of Wolvie or Wolverine from the alternate Earth of 89923. She works as a waitress at her father's bar, Bud Sud, but is also a skilled fighter who was called in to replace Wolverine after he went missing. Wolverina also has leadership skills and could potentially make a good team leader if needed. More than that, while her powers are somewhat unspecified when it comes to what they are, how powerful they can be considered. Wolverina also is a self-aware comic book character, meaning that she knows she is in a comic book and can often use this knowledge to take charge of her own narrative and break the fourth wall with, reaching out to her readers. I think having that kind of power can be pretty potent in comics, which is why she makes the cut for our most powerful part two list. And she didn't do too bad, she's about halfway up, so 
pretty impressive. Number 4, Weapon X. Weapon X comes to us from the Age of Apocalypse universe of Earth 295. Weapon X has powers similar to his Earth 616 counterpart, but his feral rages are more intense in comparison. And he initially requires Jean's assistance to calm those rages down, which was what brought the two together romantically. It would be in a fight with Cyclops when he made his way to try and save Jean Grey from Sinister that he'd lose his hand, while also taking one of Cyclops' eyes in exchange during the battle. A hand for an eye, an eye for a hand. That seems that seems pretty fair, I guess. Weapon X would later go on, despite being maimed, to become even more powerful, possibly one of the most powerful alternate versions of the character, when he surprised everyone and ended up becoming Apocalypse's heir after his defeat and the return of the Celestials. During this time, he was known as Weapon Omega, though his newfound power would only end up being temporary. Eventually, he would have this power stripped from him by Jean and return once more to being Weapon X. Also, I think I cut off this hand, but I think it's actually this hand I think that he loses. I'm trying to remember the art. I always want to mirror everything, so that's why. I don't even know if it'll be the same for you though, because this might be mirrored for you. I, I don't know. I don't know. How do you see it? Isn't camera, aren't cameras weird in the way that we see images? Isn't that all weird when you think about it? Anyways, the fact that we see images and we flip them with our eyes and it's all freaky. Number three, Earth 10005. This is the Wolverine that belongs to Fox's mutant verse, played by Hugh Jackman. In this reality, Wolverine was one of the strongest mutants around, being the only one that Kitty was able to send back in time in Days of Future Past, and the only one who was able to put a stop to Dark Phoenix when it had taken over Jean Grey, corrupting her in X-Men Last Stand. Due to his healing factor, Logan was able to walk right up to Jean while everyone else was pretty much getting turned to dust around him. He pressed forward, struggling to reach her, and then used the awesome some power of his love for her to calm Dark Phoenix down enough for him to be able to kill her with his claws, bringing Jean back but also killing both her and the Phoenix. Really, really sad. That's some pretty powerful healing factor and some pretty powerful love factor as well. Number two, Governor General Howlett. The version of Wolverine from Earth 12025 is James Howlett. And he's not just a hero, but also holds the position of Governor General to the Queen of England for Canada. For those who might not be aware, the Governor General position in Canada acts as basically the, the go between for Canada and the Queen or the Crown. They act on behalf of the Crown, and a few other nations actually also have this position. Typically nations who were granted independence from the British, as opposed to having fought against the British to free themselves from British rule, have this position. James Howlett of Earth 12025 not only was known as Governor General, but he's also known for having an adamantine laced skeleton, which is actually different from adamantium, so if you thought I was saying that wrong, I'm not, it's a different thing. This instead is a mythical type of metal belonging to the gods. This grants James an extra layer of protection on both a mystical and godlike level, which means it's very hard to mess with James in any way. James also travels and adventures when he can with his romantic partner, Hercules, which means if you mess with him, you likely also have to fight Hercules as well. Both this number and number three actually both have the power of love. The power of love. Number one, Weapon Hex. Weapon Hex comes to us from Warp World, which was created by Gamora when she folded the universe in half. Doing so caused all the souls of that universe, of course, to merge together, as we talked about with Diamond Patch, creating combined beings such as Weapon Hex, who is a combination of both Laura Kinney's X-23, aka Wolverine, and Scarlet Witch. She, as such, has the combined powers of both of these heroes, making her pretty OP, possibly even even more OP than Amalgam's Dark Claw, though she doesn't have quite as much plot armor most likely. Then again, with those two power sets, she wouldn't really need plot armor. Number 10, Lex L. We'll kick off part two with an Elseworld story. This comes from Superman issue 230. Appropriately taking place on Earth 230 as well, we see Lex Luthor as the Man of Steel. Lex L was born on Krypton in this reality, only his father was an absolute nightmare to live with. He was insane, so they both left their doomed homeworld and they both landed on Earth. Now when they crashed on Earth, they just happened to cause the deaths of these two bank robbers, Jonathan and Martha Kent. So Lana's adopted brother was actually Clark Kent, so the two ended 
ended up hating each other down the road. You know, we love opposites, a nice fun play on opposites. But I feel bad for Lex L because he's bald. He has to wear a wig in his normal life. Whereas Clark Kent in normal continuity just has to put on glasses and then he blends in. This dude has to wear, he must go through so many wigs. Those things are not cheap, no way. Number nine, Bizarro Superman. First appearing in Superboy issue 68. Bizarro was created, as you would guess, from a duplicating ray, hence the similarities, but only he's a Frankenstein clone. He has the opposite intentions. He can breathe fire and shoot ice out of his eyes, so it's, it's a fun opposite. The new 52 version of Bizarro was created when Lex Luthor tried to clone Superman, and instead of waiting 10 years for the project to be complete, Lex released him only after five, so in turn he had this pale, still shredded though, but slow version of Superman. Now the second Bizarro clone, making its first appearance with DCU Rebirth issue one, ended up teaming up with Red Hood and Artemis, but the OG version is still my favorite. Even the way he spoke, everything would be the opposite of what he wants. It was so fun. So in the words of Bizarro, don't give this video a thumbs up and certainly do not subscribe if you haven't already. Number eight, Harvey Dent. Taking a dive into Tangent Comics, this Earth-9 Supes is a telepathic and telekinetic guy who uses a golden staff. I'm already a fan. Harvey's story began after he fell off the tallest building on Earth. When he stood up with only a few scratches, it was clear that his new abilities finally arrived. Dubbed the Superman, Harvey was capable of anything he put his mind to. The reason he got those abilities goes way, way back to the 70s when Nightwing was trying to create more superhumans. They used his experimental accelerant called the Miraclo solution, which is a catchy name, gotta admit, and then he dosed an entire town in South Carolina. Harvey was the only survivor, and after teaming up with The Flash and Adam, down the road Harvey decided to remake the Miraclo solution and give it to his fiance Lola. Rumor has it she didn't survive, but she did, and she also received powers. Number seven, Karkin the Mighty. Instead of landing in America, what if Cal L landed in the darkest jungles of Africa? Coming from Superboy issue 183, Karkin was raised by gorillas, Tarzan with laser vision. What a treat. Now he realizes he's different from the others after he learns how to fly. I guess the whole being a human thing didn't tip him off, but that's great. But this guy rocks. He's not smashing through buildings, fighting General Zod. No, this time he's saving hundreds of animals from floods. Guy grabs an elephant by its ears and just flies away. What a champ. I'm also a fan of Karkin's super suit. The one strap though looks a bit annoying. I wouldn't know which side to put it on. I'd never be too sure. He could totally wear this super suit upside down if he wanted to. Just saying. Number six, Subject One. Coming from the Flashpoint universe, Superman, or I mean Subject One, had a different landing spot instead of Smallville. Kal-El crashed down here in Metropolis, of course killing random civilians, because, you know, the ship landing in the middle of a city. So the government takes custody of him, and that's when Project Superman begins. He was used as a weapon. Subject Zero, of course, also exists, starts secretly training the boy, and then Subject Two, Crypto, sacrifices its life attacking the Luthers. It's pretty dark, all these test subjects locked away in a lab their whole life. But in Flashpoint Volume 2, Issue 2, Batman, The Flash, and Cyborg come to break the Subject 1 out. And on his way out, the power source containing Subject 0 in the Phantom Zone was destroyed, so he was now free. We love a happy ending in a timeline that's been ripped apart, that is. Number five, Astro Spider. Jumping on over to Earth 3145, making his first appearance in Spider Force issue one, John Jameson was the son of Jonah Jameson. He was an astronaut for NASA, and during one trip, a spider got trapped in his suit, which already sounds like a nightmare scenario. But when the space shuttle was then hit by cosmic waves, John obtained these amazing new abilities that all merged together. Now, he didn't come home and stop bank robbers one quip at a time. See, his Earth was actually destroyed by a thermonuclear war, so Jameson was assigned to oversee the construction of a spacecraft on the Nautilus platform. He, along with 35 others, are the last of humanity. So it's a little bit different than our, you know, usual Earth 616 scenario. John can also read minds and create webs of solid telekinetic energy. He met his fate a few issues later when he was feasted on by Verna. Sometimes being a spider totem sucks. Number four, the savage Spider-Man. Less space and more savage land. This Peter Parker entered comics in Vault of Spiders, issue one. When a plane went down over Antarctica, Peter was the only survivor in his family. Now he didn't have powers just yet, but he survived using the only remaining parachute. Tragic stuff. Now during his rough emergency landing, the wind led him to touch down in a nest of giant spiders. 
And then they all just bit him nonstop until he himself gained these spider abilities. And then soon he was the new protector of Savage Land. Now later on, he was recruited into the spider army by Ghost Spider to fight off the inheritors back on our Earth 616. Number three, Hostess Cake Spider-Man. I think it's time we talk about one of the craziest versions of the webhead and perhaps one of the yummiest, I'll say. Besides Spider's Man, it's pretty yummy too. So not only is Peter dishing out quips and flips, but he's also feeding the world. This version appeared for the first time in an ad for Hostess Twinkies, so naturally its own Marvel Universe had to exist to house such a reality. And also, it's fun to talk about. So when it came down to taking on these supervillains, Spider-Man wouldn't resort to violence to get the message across. Instead, he would just huck Twinkies. He would huck fruit pies, chocolate cakes, all the treats, just Coming at ya! It's so yummy! And funny enough, in Spider-Verse issue one, the cakes are referred to as golden sponge cakes, you know, to avoid trademark issues, then they get sued. That's also the same issue where we see the end of said golden sponge cake Spidey. Short but sweet. Number two, Superior Spider-Man. Starting in 2013, this version is the outcome of the Dying Wish storyline, where Dr. Octavius planted his mind inside Peter Parker's. That's right, the two ended up switching bodies, like it's Freaky Friday, only with super abilities. That's always fun. Otto Octavius was dying, and when Peter visited, he had no idea it's actually his own deathbed that he was looking at. Let me explain. So right when Otto Octavius switched into Peter's body, he discovered what it was really like to be a hero. He understood the whole, with great power comes great responsibility thing. Having retained Peter's memories as well in this new skin suit, he decides to just go for it and fight crime, but he does it in a horrible way. He's not really sure how to balance the scales of justice just yet. He was violent when it came to handling these guys. Otto even enlarged the suit's talons to cause greater pain to his victims. Like, is he Jigsaw? Who does this? He modified the nano spider tracers as well that get ejected from said talons to paralyze the victims. Green Goblin and his army attacked, and then it was then that Otto Octavius realized he wasn't meant to be the sticky hero that he wanted to be. After coming to terms with the fact that Peter's consciousness still exists inside of him, he decided to sacrifice himself, allowing Peter to become the superior Spider-Man. Number one, Spider-Boy. Another fun amalgam making his first debut in Marvel vs. DC issue three, residing on Earth 9602, Spider-Man mixed with DC Superboy. I mean, I smell power. Need I say more? Really? Spider-Boy is a clone. Now he's a clone of Peter who was created during an accidental lab explosion. Now General Ross felt responsible so he adopted the young clone. Pete Ross and Uncle Jen. They were a fun pair until Thaddeus was taken out by a mugger. Sad stuff. So Pete now became the hero. He put together a suit, became famous almost overnight. Now back when he returned to Project Cadmus, Pete was given a web pistol to help him swing around. And on top of that, he can increase his own personal gravity to help get things done. He can focus his gravity inwards to make himself stronger and move faster, or he could lower gravity around himself in order to jump higher and further. OP, I would say you're pretty OP at that point. Number nine, Kidpool. Similar name, but much different. Kidpool comes from Earth 10330. Now he made his first appearance in Prelude to Deadpool Core issue two, and he started his days out as a student of the Xavier Orphanage for Troubled Boys. Now due to his abrasive personality, he of course didn't fit in with the other super kids, so he was lonely most of the time. Time. Now one day he was sent to detention with Scott Summers and Wade convinced Scott that they should both break out and go to prom instead. I agree, I mean detention during prom, come on, that's just cruel. But in order to convince Scotty Boy to be a rebel, Wade promised him he'd help Scott get with Jean Grey. That ought to do the trick. While at prom, Kidpool caused trouble and even fought Logan. It was a hot mess. Mr. Storm stopped the fight and Kidpool was on his way out when Deadpool arrived and also recruited this Kidpool. And before we continue with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It helps our channel out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thanks for your support. Now let's get right back to this video. Number eight, Dreadpool. In the reality of Earth 12 101, the X-Men brought Wade to Dr. Ben Brighton, AKA Psycho Man, in an attempt to cure Wade. Now they wanted him to shut down all these voices in Wade's head, but he didn't do that. He actually did the opposite. Wade was now encouraged to kill everybody in the Marvel Universe. And he started out by going after the Fantastic Four. Reed and the Thing were toast in just a couple of pages. Sue Storm held Dreadpool off by making his head explode, but once he healed, she was next to go. Dreadpool stole a device from Reed Richards that he used to take down the Watcher. So right off the bat, things get ugly. Number seven, Evil Deadpool. Keeping those sinister vibes going, Evil Deadpool is from our 616 main universe. He actually came to life during the pages of Deadpool Volume 4, Issue 44. Now it actually all started with Ella Whitby. She was a psychiatrist who was obsessed with Wade Wilson. She was so obsessed that she would keep body parts that he lost 
over time. She would collect parts of him and then keep them in her freezer, you know, right next to the ice packs, of course. So when Deadpool found out about this creepy old cold collection, he threw them all in the dumpster. He just got rid of them. But that was a mistake because once those body parts thawed out, they fused together to make another evil Deadpool. Just the smell of that freezer alone. I would have tapped out by day three. Number six, Wolverine Pool. This next one is a total badass. One of my favorites, if you ask me. Brief, but definitely memorable. First appearing in Cable in Deadpool issue 46, we see Wade Wilson after he's undergone the Weapon X program. He has a skeleton bonded with adamantium, and then he's recruited by Dreadpool to take on the evil Deadpool core members. So we join the battle and kill Deadpool Pulp, but during the fight, Main Wade tossed a grenade full of bugs at Wolverine Pool. So the grenade went off and the bugs chewed at Wade's skin, just chewed him apart until nothing was left over except the adamantium skeleton and claws. Definitely the grossest way to go out, that's for sure. Number five, death mask. While I mentioned a botched surgery earlier with Wade, this next one went exactly as planned. On Earth 11683, Reed Richards was able to remove a lethal brain tumor from Wade's head, so now he was better off than ever. No evil voices, and now he was actually a genius. But did he change the world one revolutionary invention at a time? Nope, he was a master criminal. But still, he's smart, I don't know. He built an empire. Wade went by the name Death Mask and killed that world's Victor Von Doom, and his outfit was actually a red version of Doom's. It was pretty sweet, I'm not gonna lie. Even after Death Mask was beaten by our main Deadpool, it didn't end there. Death Mask made a deal with Mephisto in order to release monsters on Earth, one of those monsters being Infernal Hulk. Ouch. Number four, Dogpool. Wade Wilson of Earth 103173, aka Dogpool, made his first appearance in Prelude to Deadpool Core issue three. Now, Wilson was a dog being used as a test subject for Mascara X, this hot new product that could replenish itself after just one use. How beautiful and lovely and convenient, might I add. Now, this version obviously is inspired from real life animal testing and abuse that happens, so it's pretty sweet when Wilson gets superpowers. Now, they thought the dog didn't make it after a test, his body turned all corpse like, so they got rid of it. But those regenerative abilities brought this pet back to life. A circus truck just ended up going by and seeing this immortal dog, and then Deadpool became the starring act of their show. Come and see the death-defying hound. What a headline. He was working there until Deadpool came and also recruited him for the Deadpool Corps. Number three, Dead Man Wade. Coming from the Age of Apocalypse storyline on Earth 295, Dead Man Wade was initially part of Apocalypse's Pale Riders. Danny Moonstar would just torture him nonstop. That was his whole thing. But that's gotta be a bit distracting, right? While the Riders were seeking out Avalon, Damask was so annoyed by the torture and the sounds that she strangled Moonstar to death. She just couldn't take it anymore. It's like when my sister would sing Taylor Swift, I'm like, a four hour drive, come on. So dead man Wade wasn't too happy at this point, but when they finally arrived to Avalon, Wade's attack on innocent people was so much that Nightcrawler deemed it necessary to end his life. And he did so by teleporting away whilst grabbing his head. If you want to see dead man Wade in more agony, begin so with Excalibur issue one. Number two, Ultimate Deadpool. Wade E. Wilson from the Ultimate Comic Run, Earth 1610 that is, made his first appearance at Ultimate Spider-Man issue 91. Now he had a pretty rough time when it comes to the Ultimates. The the Ultimates are a different story, different origins, but Wade's is still bad. See, in Ultimate Spider-Man, Wadey Wilson gets recruited to hunt down mutants on live television, which sounds like a pretty cool gig, but the government figured this is what the people want, and honestly, they're not too far off. People love tuning in. This is like the hot show. It's the talk of the town. And his appearance is even more shocking once Spider-Man unmasks him, and the fact that he does so on live television causes Wadey to go nuts. And it was even worse than that because Spider-Man made him feel horrible for how he looked. He said his face smelled like a KFC dumpster on a hot day. What a roast. Oh my God, Spider-Man, relax. And also in Ultimate Spider-Man issue 92, Spider-Man is about to be unmasked himself, but Deadpool prevents it from happening. He says to respect the mask. How ironic. Number one, Lady Deadpool. We just met Lady Loki and she kind of stole the entire show on Disney Plus, so we gotta end this list with Lady Deadpool. Wanda Wilson from Earth 3010 made her first appearance in Deadpool Merc of the Mouth issue seven. Now this version of Deadpool cared, dare I say. She wanted to at least feel like she belonged and was part of a bigger, more important movement. So she led an assault force against the crooked General America, which was an evil Captain America in that world. And then she eventually found her place leading the Deadpool Corps, that team I've been mentioning Throughout this entire list. In fact, Lady Deadpool was the one to tip off our main 616 Wade on the whole operation. Wade actually tossed Headpool at General America, but then he bit his arm off. Headpool was from the zombie universe, so Wade had to take the General's infected arm with him after he left Wanda's Earth. All the blood, all the arms, all the Deadpools, 
all the fun. Number 5, Injustice Batman. Batman in Injustice not only has the moral high ground against Superman, who becomes a villain in this reality after the death of Lois Lane and their unborn child at his own hands due to the machinations of Joker and Harley Quinn, but Batman here also possesses the super pill, or more specifically, the 5U93R pill which kind of spells super if you look at it. This pill when ingested allows Batman or his ally, father figure and loyal butler Alfred to go toe to toe with Superman, meeting him on his level when it comes to strength and durability. Number 4, The Merciless. The Merciless is like the Wonder Woman version of the Dark Knights, as each of the core members is kind of meant to be a stand in for a member of the Justice League. He initially teamed up with Diana Prince aka Wonder Woman to take down Ares on his world of negative Earth. 12 in the Dark Multiverse, but after doing so, was forced to take Ares' helmet before Wonder Woman could and use it to defeat her. He basically knew that Diana would not allow him to use it otherwise, and so he was like, nah, I kind of got to take it, otherwise it won't get used. He took up her symbol in her honor and wields the power of Ares, but multiplied. He is amazingly strong and durable, can summon any weapon, influence others to anger or fighting, and is pretty much god level, so yeah. Number 3, Super Batman. Super Batman was the name given to the Batman of Earth 1 when he traveled to Zur NR. In the main continuity, Zur NR was the name of Batman's alternate persona created when he witnessed the traumatic event of his parents being murdered that resides deep within his psyche. However, initially Zur NR was the name given to a faraway planet in the golden age of Batman comics. It first appeared in issue 113 of Batman in the story Batman the Superman of Planet X. Here, Batman of Earth 1 is teleported a great distance to Zur NR to aid Batman, the scientist Tlano, who watched Batman from afar through a telescope and was inspired to become the Batman of his own world. So he's also Batman. However, the intergalactic threat that Tlano Batman faces here is too great, and he needs Earth 1 Batman's help. On this planet, Earth 1 Batman's unique Earth based human physiology makes him super strong, durable, and able to fly. Basically, he becomes Superman in terms of what he's capable of, which also at this time period I feel like would be pretty off the charts. Batman uses his powers to help Tolano and then is returned home afterwards and given one of Tolano's devices to keep as a memento. It doesn't work though, so it's basically just a little bit of junk that he can keep in his trophy case. Yay! <laughs> Number 2, Dark Father. Dark Father was ultimately beaten by the superhero Holy Trinity, but only while they all kind of had a power upgrade all their own. He hails from the Dark Multiverse and is an alternate version of Bruce Wayne, who defeated Darkseid and took all his power and knowledge for himself afterward. Batman as Dark Father as such is a new god and also wields the anti-life equation, which he uses to influence others and to imprison them, forcing them to obey him and his will. He also also has all the brilliance of main continuity Bruce and more. Number 1, Batman Who Laughs. Also known as the Darkest Knight, the Batman Who Laughs is an alternate version that is a combination of Batman and Joker. He comes from the dark multiverse reality of Negative Earth 22, where he as Batman ended up killing the Joker by snapping his neck after being pushed to the brink by the villain who was dying anyways admittedly. When he did so, however, he became infected by Joker Venom that was released by this very final action. After becoming infected, Bruce went insane and had most of his Bat family killed, except for his biological son, Damian Wayne, who joined his side. Batman Who Laughs would go on to become super powerful after acquiring the powers of Dr. Manhattan when he had his brain transplanted into the body of the Dr. Manhattan Batman alternate. The Darkest Knight even before this power upgrade was already pretty powerful because one, he was super popular which always gives characters power and two, he was a mentally ill genius which made him extremely deadly and dangerous to take on and kinda unpredictable. He also often fought against the superheroes he came up against with dark metal. In some cases, managing to infect them and in so doing, recruit them to his own dark army. Plus, he's got all those dark knights, so that's just another thing. Number 10, Arana. Arana is definitely one of the most random alternates for Wonder Woman. She was an Amazon who only made a few appearances in the comics in the Earth 1 continuity and would take the Wonder Woman mantle from Diana after beating her in a contest of champions. Arana was very skilled and did beat Diana, which is why I thought it was relevant to include her here. Though it should also be noted that she mainly won especially the last contest because Diana's concern for the safety of others 
slowed her down. While Hippolyta initially proclaimed her daughter the victor of the contest due to her heroism, the gods disagreed and made Arana the winner instead. Diana chose to accept their will and handed over the position and title to Arana. Arana, however, would prove to be out of her league when she ventured into man's world, mainly failing as Wonder Woman due to her stubbornness and a string of misunderstandings. She was still pretty strong though. And of course, she was still the rightful victor of the contest and for that, I thought she might be a cool alternative to highlight. Arana's story as Wonder Woman takes place over the course of two issues from Wonder Woman 250 to issue 251. Arana would also inspire a follow up red headed Wonder Woman character who would appear later on in the comics. Not inspire her as a person, but just inspire that character to exist. Number 9 Earth 2 Wonder Woman Earth 2 Wonder Woman was the first version of the character we were introduced to in the comics, with her making her very first appearance back in 1942 in All Star Comics issue number 8. This version of Diana would have tons of gadgets, including her earrings, which granted her whatever amount of oxygen she needed to survive, no matter where she was, gave her enhanced hearing, allowed her to survive without needing to consume food, and she could use them as a communication device, communicating at one point with the leader of Venus. That is a very versatile versatile accessory. Although she was very strong and had various gadgets at her disposal to enhance her abilities, Diana did still possess the weakness that if she was bound by any man, she would lose all of her power. However, being bound by a woman, at least, doesn't have that effect. And as soon as Wonder Woman can get free, her powers do return to her. Also, good luck trying to bind Wonder Woman. I feel like that would be challenging. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Wonder Woman lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8 Artemis Back in the New Earth days, there was a time when Artemis became the new Wonder Woman. Artemis is from the Ban Amigdal tribe of Amazons who hail from Egypt. Artemis would become Wonder Woman after Hippolyta had a vision of the hero dying, and not wanting her daughter to die, decided to challenge the fates by electing a new Wonder Woman. Artemis managed to win this contest and as such became the new Wonder Woman, being given magical artifacts of her own, including the Gauntlet of Atlas, which multiplied her strength by tenfold, the Sandals of Hermes, which granted her swiftness and flight, and of course, the lasso of truth. Artemis stood apart from Diana as Wonder Woman, but was less respected due to her violent approach to heroics and her more edgy past. Also sadly, it turned out that Hippolyta's vision would still come true, with Artemis later dying while carrying the mantle. Don't worry though, she would be resurrected as is usually the way with comic book characters. Artemis was also that other red-headed Wonder Woman who Arana's story and character design likely paved the way for. Number 7 Future State Wonder Woman I think we can safely say that Yara Flora was a pretty powerful Wonder Woman when we got to peer into the future in Future State and get a preview of Yara taking up that mantle. Yara herself, like Diana, is an Amazon, but one who comes from a different Amazonian tribe who split off from the women who reside on Themyscira. Her tribe is known as the Amazons of the Amazon, and like Wonder Woman, Yara herself is a demigod and as such possesses divine empowerment. She is super strong, super fast, and can fly, and even if she couldn't fly, she would have her winged horse Jerry to back her up. Yara Flora also possesses her own kind of lasso of truth, known as the Golden Boliadoras, which works a little differently. The Golden Boliadoras gives her control over her lassoed opponents, compelling them to bend to her will, which means she can not only compel them to tell the truth, but can also compel people to act as she wills them to. Number 6 Flashpoint Wonder Woman Definitely one of the scariest alternates of Wonder Woman out there, this alternate version is specifically an alternate version of Diana herself and hails from the Flashpoint timeline. A dark timeline indeed. Here, Diana the Amazons and Themyscira are at war with Aquaman and Atlantis. In the animated film Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox, this version of Wonder Woman is at war with Aquaman because she killed Mera after the Queen found out about her and Aquaman having an affair. Whereas in the comics, it was the assassination of Diana's mother, Hippolyta, at the hands of an Atlantean during her and Aquaman's political wedding that started the conflict. But what both versions have in common, regardless of how the conflict started, is that they are both ruthless, bloodthirsty and determined in their war against Atlantis. Number 5 Dr. Anthony Stark This version of Tony Stark only makes a brief appearance in the comics, having appeared less than a handful of times and making his first appearance in all new X-Men Annual issue number 1. He hails from the reality temporarily numbered 591, not an official number just yet. Here Tony Stark has become Sorcerer Supreme of the entire galaxy in this alternate future of the year 2099. He he discusses the blend and interchangeability of both science and magic. It seems as the years passed for this Tony, he only became even smarter, wiser, and more mystical.
Neat. Number 4. MCU Iron Man Iron Man in the Marvel Cinematic Universe was the one who managed to put a stop to Thanos once and for all. He created a gauntlet capable of handling and wielding the awesome power of the Infinity Stones and was also the one to discover time travel. Well, to discover a version of time travel that actually worked. Banner was close of course, but I don't think either he or Scott Lang would have gotten there in time without Tony Stark's breakthrough aha moment. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe as well, Tony Stark is the main creator of Ultron. While this ended up overall being a bad move on his part as Ultron became a supervillain, the accomplishment of creating an AI that powerful and complex is still really impressive. And without Ultron, we'd never have gotten Vision. This version of the character played by Robert Downey Jr. also really helped to skyrocket Iron Man's popularity in the comics and around the world. RIP MCU Iron Man. You will be missed. Number three, Iron Lantern. I'm really happy that this is the amalgamated version of this name that we went with instead of Green Man, which is less exhilarating by comparison. Green Man. Iron Lantern is a hero who comes to us from the Amalgam Verse, and unsurprisingly, he is a mashup of DC's Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, and Marvel's Iron Man, Tony Stark. His name is Harold Hal Stark, and he gets his powers from a suit he made using a battery that he found amidst the wreckage of an alien ship. I love Amalgam characters. Number 2, Iron Hammer. Stark Odinson is the version of Tony and Thor who hails from Warp World. Warp World was created when Gamora folded the universe in half using the power of the infinity stones. She then sealed these blended souls within the soul stone. While everything would be set right, this version of the universe was still allowed to continue to exist and kind of made its own thing, which I'm happy about because Warp World is pretty cool. Iron Hammer has both the ingenuity and brilliant armor of Tony Stark, as well as the Asgardian strength, immortality, and hammer Mjolnir of Thor Odinson. Number 1. Infamous Iron Man Controversial opinion possibly, but I think Victor Von Doom is the most powerful of all of the Iron Mans. Doom took up the mantle of Iron Man following the events of Civil War II, which saw Tony left in a coma as a result of a fight with Captain Marvel. Doctor Doom, after the events of Secret Wars, had been looking to turn over a new leaf, and had decided to ally himself with Tony Stark as such, which also meant fighting on his side during Civil War II. In his honor, Doom took up the mantle of infamous Iron Man and proved himself to be one of the most capable versions of the hero that we've ever seen. Honestly, I feel like Doom as any hero or villain is just would be so powerful. I just love Dr. Doom. I don't know. Spoiler alert, I love Dr. Doom. You already knew that. When this happened, even the villains knew they needed to be on high alert, gathering to discuss an alliance as they assumed this would be the only way to protect themselves against infamous Iron Man, only to have Doom drop in on the meeting and make quick work of, well, pretty much all of them. Infamous Iron Man was great and honestly, it was too short lived. Come back, infamous Iron Man. Come back to us. Number 10, Zombie Dark Phoenix. This version of Jean does have some perks when it comes to power set, but ultimately her downfall is, well, being stuck in the Marvel Zombies universe, where many zombies get taken out by fellow zombie hero Hulk. Here, however, Jean is supposed to possess the Phoenix Force still, which in theory I think should have allowed her to resurrect herself, but maybe that works differently when you get completely punched to smithereens by the Hulk. But I mean literally, she gets punched through the torso and then the Hulk crushes her head with his fist in Marvel Zombies 2 issue 5. It's quite gratuitous because, well, Marvel Zombies. Still however, in theory, the zombified version of Jean should have been considered one of the most powerful. And overall, for the zombie heroes, even being defeated by the Hulk, she was considered one of the most powerful, running with the zombie Galacti, aka Power Cosmic Zombies on Earth 2149 or Earth Z prior to her death. Number 9. Ultimate Jean Grey Ultimate Jean Grey ended up becoming the leader of Tian, which I think gives her a power boost, but on the other hand, she was not made as powerful as her 616 counterpart when it comes to her abilities, so for that, she gets moved down a peg. While telekinesis was initially Jean's main power set on Earth 616, here in the Ultimate Universe, Jean seemed to primarily be more of a telepath, who also has telekinetic abilities. Jean as a telepath can psychically cloak herself or others, but not against stronger telepaths. She can heal trauma or give you trauma by altering your memories. She can give others amnesia too and use her telepathy to create 
vivid and realistic illusions. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more lists about Jean Grey or just more mutant lists in general, because I love doing those, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up and maybe share it, maybe give it to a friend you think, you know, needs a little a little Jean Grey in their day. Number eight, Jean Grey Earth 18119. Earth 18119 is the reality of Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows. It was destroyed and then incorporated into Doctor Doom's Battle World and after the destruction of Battle World, was then completely recreated and incorporated into the multiverse by Mr. Fantastic. On this Earth, Jean's power levels are comparable to her main continuity counterpart, but she also has the added strength of being a mother, which probably makes her both a more determined hero and teacher in this reality. On Earth 18119, Jean ended up breaking up with Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, after he lost faith in Professor X's vision, and instead ended up dating and later marrying Wolverine. Together they have a daughter named Kate, whose codename is Shine. And she's super cute. Number seven, Madeline Pryor. A lot of people think of Maddie as being a weaker version of Jean because she's a clone, but I would argue Maddie is either on the same level of Jean or at least has the potential to be at Jean's level or even more powerful. Why? Well, Madeline Pryor might be a clone, but Mr. Sinister also made her using a part of the Phoenix Force, which means that Madeline Pryor is kind of both Jean and the Phoenix Force all in one. She has like built in Phoenix, which you'd think would make her connection just a touch stronger. Madeline also known as the Goblin Queen, is also well versed in magic, something Jean hasn't really dipped into herself. I'm not saying she's more powerful than Jean Grey every day of the week, I'm just saying the potential for her to be more powerful here and there definitely exists, at least in my opinion. Number 6, Black Queen. This alternate version of Jean Grey comes to us from Earth 39529, which we get to peer into through 1989's What If series in issue 59. This What If asks the question, what if Wolverine led Alpha Flight? The answer? Well, the fate of Jean Grey would end up really, really dark. Wolverine becomes the leader of the Alpha Flight team due to the fact that the X-Men were unable to rescue him as their rescue team was killed by the Canadian military. Alpha Flight are the ones sent to rescue Jean after she ends up brainwashed by the Hellfire Club and joins them. Unfortunately, upon arrival, Wolverine learns it is too late as this version of Jean has already gone full Dark Phoenix. Logan has no other choice in this reality but to kill her in order to protect everyone else, basically on planet Earth. I don't know about you, but a complete completely evil Jean Grey who has gone full dark phoenix seems pretty powerful to me. I think Logan got lucky by even being able to kill her. Number 5, Superwoman. Even as a mother to be, Superwoman is really terrifying. Superwoman is the dark alternate of Wonder Woman who hails from Earth 3. But while she is like a parallel for the hero in terms of her place on the crime syndicate in comparison to the Justice League, she is not an alternate of Diana Prince. Instead, Superwoman is none other than an alternate version of Lois Lane, but one who is evil, diabolical diabolical and superpowered. Superwoman possesses superhuman strength, durability, is immortal, and can fly. She is also a master manipulator who comes armed with her lasso of submission, which bends the will of any ensnared in it, making them both obey and love Superwoman. However, her barbed lasso doesn't work on all who she ensnares in it, and some with superbly strong will have managed to resist its control. Number 4, Earth 23 Wonder Woman. On Earth 23, Nubia is the world's Wonder Woman. She serves on the Justice League along with Calvin Ellis' Superman, Batman, Red Tornado, Green Lantern, Mr. Miracle, Vixen, Steel, Zatanna, The Guardian, Black Lightning, and Cyborg, a much more diverse alternate version of the League. Earth 23 Nubia possesses powers that put her on a level similar to that of Diana of the main continuity. Like Diana, she possesses divine empowerment, is an extremely masterful warrior, is immortal, and comes armed with her lasso gauntlets or bracelets and her invisible jet. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, quick alert, alert, we have a new channel coming your way. It is called Nerd Elite. That is right, we are doing another channel and I'm so excited for you to check it out. So make sure you do so, go subscribe, follow, do all the things. Number 3, Donna Troy, aka the original Wonder Girl. Donna Troy has also gone by a few other names over the years and had her origins reworked a few different times. Currently, her backstory is that she was built as a weapon to be used against Wonder Woman, being created by the Amazon witch Darano, vengeful ex of Queen Hippolyta. Donna, however, would overcome her villainous origins and become a hero in her own right, taking up the mantle of Wonder Girl and serving on the Teen Titans. Back in the New Earth continuity, Donna Troy took up the mantle of Wonder Woman during the the events of one year later, after Diana stepped down in order to do some soul searching. 
Number 2. Hippolyta Hippolyta is of course her own character and the mother of Diana Prince aka our main Wonder Woman, but currently in the comics she has also moved over to become the new Wonder Woman with the Justice League. Hippolyta decided to take her daughter's place as one of Earth's most powerful heroes following the events of Dark Knight's death metal where Diana basically became one with the cosmos after taking on the power of Perpetua and sacrificing herself to save the multiverse. As Diana rests, Hippolyta decided she should take up her daughter's mantle and has left Nubia to rule Themyscira in her place. Hippolyta is one of the most gifted Amazons around, being a gifted and wise leader, impressively fierce warrior, and brilliant strategist. Number 1. Aurora with Themyscira This version of Wonder Woman comes to us from the Amalgam Universe, a crossover world where DC and Marvel characters become merged together. If you are a Marvel and Mutant fan like me, you probably already guessed which Marvel character Diana was combined with here. Aurora with Themyscira is a combination of both DC's Wonder Woman and, of course, Marvel's Storm, a famous member of the X-Men and former Queen of Wakanda. Combining both the powers and abilities of these two powerhouse characters makes Aurora one of the strongest alternate versions of Wonder Woman we've seen yet, and one of my favorites.